because I know the Lord knows I'd done all I could to I got cross-eyed, but uh, I trusted those guys to do a good job. And believe it or not, I haven't seen this show. You're seeing it the first time just with me. Mark just Mark just finished it. So we're going to start with CSX and predecessors. Are you running the things there, Mark? Yeah, I'm sorry. All right. Is it working yet? Yeah. Oh, let me try it. No. There you go. All right. Uh, so we're going to start off with CSX and a little bit of Chessie. And a lot of this stuff will be Kentucky and Tennessee, but I've traveled extensively over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, some places more than once. Uh, this is a set of Chessie Power leading a Great Ghost uh, CSX unit under the uh, Western Maryland Bridge uh, departing uh, Cumberland, Maryland. Uh, and if you need to know the dates, let me know. I'm just going to kind of guess it. But this would have been in the, I uh, believe, the, um, probably the middle of the late 80s. Uh, back at this back at this time, I was using a uh, Canon AE1. Uh, uh, some of the younger people might not remember the cameras that you know you don't have to have batteries to use. The AE1 was my favorite body, and uh, the only battery you had in it was a little watch battery to run the uh, light meter, and you didn't have to have that to use it. Uh, the Chessy uh, SD50, actually fairly new at that time, sitting at, uh, in the helper pocket at Sandpatch, Pennsylvania, after shoving a train up the mountain out of Cumberland. And that is uh, also probably late 80s in Cincinnati, uh, somewhere around CUT. And I don't recognize that spot. I believe it's Huntington, West Virginia, but I could be wrong. Uh, but it's, you know, every day you see a chassis system could boost, could boost that clean. Back in the day, Charleston and Huntington, West Virginia and Russell, back when coal was running, I tell you what, they were just as busy, busy as Ravenna and Corbin was. You could go up there and just sit in one place and watch train after train after train. This is a Chessie and a Delaware and Hudson engine uh, bringing a train down Sandpatch, Sandpatch grade. Uh, this would have been in, I believe, the early 90s. This is at a place called uh, Fairhope, uh, one of the scenic places there in the Wills Valley. Uh, we used to go up Sandpatch probably once or twice a year when things were a lot, lot busier up there. <coughs> And instead of Chessie pushers uh, crossing the Rock Castle River uh, down in Livingston, Kentucky on the CC subdivision, uh, this is not too far from where they had that big derailment here just a little while back, I believe. All right at the bottom of the hill. It's uphill out of Livingston both ways. Uh, an old uh, LNN and Seaboard SD40 2. And believe it or not, uh, this is taking leaving uh, Ravenna here down by the river, just off to our left, not very yeah, far. Yep. You came across the big green bridge coming in, <coughs> off on the right. That's right where that is. Yeah. One of the things I liked about this shot, I shoot a lot of roster shots just for myself, but one reason I included this in it is you see all the foreground obstructions. And at this time, all the code line on the EK was still up. And just look at that mess of copper wires. Point. Point. Huh? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, that's a southbound leaving Corbin, I believe, down around Faber. Everybody's ugly duckling. I don't remember seeing <laughs> too many of these. Uh, I do remember. I do remember this was uh, Evansville, Indiana, 
And I think this is the only one I ever seen that actually didn't have the uh, cab plated over and turned into a bee unit. I never did get lucky enough to catch one leading though. So no L and N cab uh, set in the yard at the Corsi in uh, nice seaboard paint. That would look good behind the uh, seaboard Jeep out here. And back Corbin in its better days, uh, back when GEs were actually cool to look at, uh, and sitting outside the service center at Corbin, this would probably have been in the early 90s. And uh, Corbin at that time was Cold War still running. It was a busy, busy place. It's just a, it's a shame to go down there now and see it's just a shell of its usual, of what it used to be. Another coal train leaving Corbin uh, down at, uh, I believe that's Bacon Creek, just to just the south side of the yard. Loads, meat, and empties. Uh, this is on the CC sub. Uh, you know, uh, that's one of the early uh, unpopular CSX paint schemes there. Or a very faded seaboard. I can't really tell from here, but that's at Brush Creek which is on the CC uh, just uh, down the road from Sinks where the Lebanon branch comes out. And we will be a little bit of good foreign stuff in here too because like I say, I've traveled a lot and we tried to include a few things of a different. Uh, back right before uh, CSS absorbed the uh, RF and P, which ran between uh, Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia. I made a couple of trips up there uh, to try to shoot what was left of the RF and P, and, and was lucky. Uh, I believe with their cab signal system, uh, their engines had to still lead at that time, so it didn't matter what the rest of the power was. It was always going to have an RF and P leader. And this was taken on the uh, uh, Marine base at Quantico, Virginia, which, you know, back at that time, there was, an, there was a public Amtrak uh, station there on the marine base and all you had to do was stop at the uh, guard gate and tell them you're going to Amtrak station and they didn't look at you twice. I had to make sure to add that as a little nod to the card in there. And something I thought was kind of neat, uh, our F&P uh, or Jenny I assume they were using it for ballast. They had a string of these sitting uh, in a siding at uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, one afternoon. Uh, surely came from the DM and IR or something on the or iron ore rows up north. Uh, nice, very clean, no graffiti, unpatched RFMB caboose. And that is at Alexandria, Virginia. And an ex, uh, I believe that's an ex Clinchfield uh, unit uh, out on the Clinchfield. I'm not sure what tunnel that is. Uh, C-150, okay, that's on the CC then. Uh, that was back when CSX was a little bit more fun and you had all the predecessors and they didn't paint things and you really just never knew know what was going to show up when you went out to shoot CSX. Good looking seaboard switcher, that's it uh, down in uh, Louisville. And I'll tell you a funny story. Casey was starting to uh, scan all these slides and he had separated out CSX stuff and uh, Steam and NS and whatnot. And we came to the conclusion that I must have only shot CSX on cloudy days. And I believe this is a Corbin uh, SDP 45 or 35, and I can't tell what that rear unit is. Uh, the P course stood for, uh, they were uh, intended to be dual servers for freight and passengers and had a steam generator in the uh, end of the long hood. Uh, 
And everybody knows I'm not a big GE fan, but that wasn't always the case. Back in the day, uh, you know, GEs kind of looked like this, and the, and the U33s and 33Cs, they were actually good-looking locomotives, not like today where just everything looks the same no matter what model it is. Big chess, or a seaboard, uh, seaboat that uh, on the Y at Corbin. Seaboard 1066, uh, that's at uh, Camelsburg, Kentucky, out on the uh, uh, LCL. And I kind of had a long running relationship with this engine. Uh, there used to be a daily local come out of Louisville, C799, that came up to Frankfurt and Jet and did all the switching up in that area. And uh, me and a couple of my buddies got to know, know the crews pretty good there, but it uh, seems like the 1066 was almost always a power for that job. And you'll see some more of it here coming in just a minute. Now here's some rare stuff. Can anybody tell me where that's at? Mm -mm. Yeah, this is uh, it's been tore out and gone for years and years but uh, up towards the top of Jet Hill there used to be a place called Cliffside Junction and that's where the uh, LNA and the RF and, or RF and P, the uh, Ronnie B joined uh, into the existing LNA main line and went out towards Millville and you know back in the day it went to Versailles and on out towards Richmond and a piece that they called it the Hermitage Spur uh, there at the end, and uh, this is the the big wooden bridge just outside of Cliffside on the on the spur across the uh, there's a big creek right there. Capitol Building's off to the left, uh, not too far, and this was uh, probably the second or third last train they ran out there. And the only uh, customer on the Hermitage branch there. Uh, uh, was an interesting one for sure. Uh, down in Millville, there's uh, remnants of several distilleries, uh, whiskey and bourbon distilleries down there, and one of them is Jim Beam. And Jim Beam uh, didn't have a lot of uh, bottling capacity that needed it, I believe, at Louisville. So uh, when the distillery at Louisville made, you know, 30,000 gallons of bourbon, they loaded them in uh, tank cars, shipped it by uh, CSX, uh, down to Millville to the plant down there where it got uh, uh, put into barrels and uh, stored at the warehouses down there then eventually bottled. That was the only traffic left on that line uh, when they pulled it up and the distillery fought the distillery fought uh, head and nail to try to keep the railroad but uh, that line had a couple big bridges on it and uh, I just was I guess CSX it just wasn't worth maintaining it for the little bit of revenue that came from it. Yeah. If yeah, if they had more than one tank car, which they usually did, they'd have to bring them uh, to all the way to Millville one at a time because of weight restriction on this bridge here and another one. Same That's the same bridge from uh, up on uh, the Frankfurt Bypass, and you can see the uh, uh, capital in the background. Are any of your shops from underneath the bridge in there? I don't think so. Those are really nice. That kind of artsy with all the braces and everything under the bridge. Mark, are you advancing things? I can't tell if you are or I am. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. I'm going to let you do it, and I just won't hold this in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, an old rugged uh, l and caboose wearing a CSBD patch. Uh, seems like all, a bunch of these cabooses got saved and donated to town. I couldn't tell you where this one is, but there's a good chance it probably still survives. And uh, this is downtown Cartersville, Georgia, a set of uh, tote boats bringing an intermodal through town uh, in the spring of the crepe myrtle bloom in there. Uh, SD-45, 
and seaboard. Uh, not sure what what it started life as. So I need Larry Smock here to correct me on all this stuff. Our walk-in locomotive encyclopedia, but he could make it today. Uh, and that was actually in the deadline down in Huntington. Uh, at one time, Huntington shops were so busy that they had just hundreds, if not 500 locomotive store anywhere in that area. They every track that could hold an engine was uh, had an engine in it. Uh, let's see, board SW 1500. That's in uh, also in Huntington in the storage line there with a looks like a Chessie GP30 ahead of it. A uh, good-looking seaboard paint leader there bringing the train uh, uh, east under the signal at uh, Taze Valley, West Virginia, which is just the other side of, uh, well, actually, it's in between St. Albans and Charleston. We used to spend a lot of time on that line, too. It was very scenic and it had a lot of trains on it. Uh, this might uh, look familiar to some of our Corbin guys. Uh, I guess most of you are familiar with the KU Brown Power Plant, which is located off the NS there between Bergen and Harrisburg. Uh, most of their coal used to come off the, a, a mine out of hazard on the EK. So CSX would bring a loaded train in, hand it off to the NS in uh, Lexington. The NS would run around it, take it to the power plant. Uh, spot loads bringing empty train back and the CSX crew usually if they weren't going to be too long would uh, wait and take the empty train back to Ravenna. Uh, this is uh, at the uh, where the old site of the Kentucky Railway Museum used to be at Ormsby Station in Anchorage uh, right outside of Louisville. Uh, couple well actually three different uh, CSX paint schemes there but of note if you notice the uh, large green tank setting off to the right uh, that was my first vehicle I ever had a 1972 40 uh, four-door Pontiac Catalina and it's a good thing it was built like a tank I did a, a lot of rail fan in that vehicle Probably couldn't, with today's gas prices, probably couldn't afford to pay the gas for it. This is a train cross, a Ravenna bound train crossing the Howard Creek Viaduct just outside of Winchester on the EK. This is RU Cabin in Russell, Kentucky, out on the CNO. Uh, back when CSX was so busy, they were leasing anything that ran, and they had. At least a whole slew of uh, Santa Fe GEs, which I always thought were kind of neat looking. That's our RU cabin off to the left there. And I don't know, this might make a little look familiar. Y'all seen it this morning. A little bit different paint scheme back then, but the uh, 1100 in the storage line at Huntington, uh, this would probably been the early 1990s. Uh, this is at uh, one of the entrances to Ravenna shops back in the day. And that's also at Ravenna. Very easy to tell by the knobs in the background. Nice mother and slug set. This is a loaded coal train uh, leaving uh, Ravenna, running alongside the river. As Casey said, about two blocks that away uh, on a good spring day. And it must be spring because the kudzu wasn't up over the rails yet. <laughs> and here's one that's kind of bittersweet. Uh, kind of telling my age, I know there's a lot of younger folks here, but uh, at one time over in Winchester where the EK subdivision uh, connected up with the uh, CC, uh, that was known as Patio, and the uh, Patio Tower was uh, one of the last manned interlocking towers of the state. Uh, 
when they remote controlled it in Jacksonville, uh, the tower came down about uh, probably three or four months later. It didn't last long. Uh, the, I remember this was on a Saturday or Sunday before the Monday it got tore down. It's another shot of Patio Tower with uh, Ravenna Switcher coming out next to it. This would have been a uh, CSX Derby train coming back into Frankfurt behind a couple of F units and an F-40. Back when the uh, Derby trains were a heck of a lot more interesting. Uh, once they got away from using the uh, F units, you really never knew what was going to show up on there. It might have been a freshly painted SD-40 or the most ready GE they could find. It just didn't seem like that mattered to them. Uh, and thankfully, uh, now CSX and kind of got the kind of got their uh, ducks in a row over that. The last few Derby trains I shot, the CSX was had good-looking power on it, and uh, same train uh, crossing the Kentucky River at West Frankfort siding. And uh, this is at Cumberland, Maryland, sitting around uh, one of the shop leads. So yeah, I spent a lot of time up in that area back in the 90s. We went up there probably once or twice a year. Uh, used to know that area like the back of my hand, all the back roads and everything else. And I don't know if I could find Cumberland anymore. <laughs> this is a westbound train uh, at Greenup, Kentucky on the old C&O. Just says departed uh, the yard at Russell. And uh, it's crossing a the creek there, and the mighty Ohio River is just out of sight to the left on the other side of the bridge. A uh, couple of CSX, uh, I believe MP 1500s. Uh, another set of tote boats at uh, uh, Brush Creek, thank you. If y'all have any questions or anything to speak up or if I get something wrong and correct me, feel free because uh, my memory ain't what it used to be. And like I say, I've seen all these pictures, but I've not seen the show. So uh, this is the uh, CSX train uh, departing Lexington towards Winchester. Uh, this is in the vicinity of where the uh, belt line connects to and the uh, Rupp Yard would be across the uh, back towards the rear of the train there. That would have been uh, 540 or 547. And we'll go a little bit north. Uh, Eric Landrum, who I was hoping was going to make it today, uh, had a way of getting me out of my comfort zone. Usually if I was in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, or Tennessee, I was happy. But for some reason, he found a way to drag me to some of the most god-awful places like Indiana <laughs> and Ohio <laughs> and Michigan. And, uh, yeah, I know, it was rough. But uh, uh, this was taken in the early 2000s, and even back then, this was kind of a rare shot. This is a train going towards Washington uh, Courthouse. Uh, this is a Laguti. Indiana coming across the B and O out of Cincinnati. And while we're in the CSX section, this is a CSX motor, but this is actually on the NS coming through downtown Harrodsburg. I don't think that And the same shot uh, at, uh, East Her or excuse me, yeah, East Harrodsburg out by the bypass uh, right after it was uh, it was built, it hadn't been that long. Did they catch a signal to drive that fast? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's a Furex leader, but there's another genuine CSX train on the old road sub uh, there at, uh, what was that, Jed and McKee Block, mm -hmm. uh, which is at uh, Ducker Station in Kentucky. Uh, those fur I don't know if y'all ever seen any of the Furex lease engines when they were new and they just had to rebuilt, but. I tell you what, as far as lease power goes, those things were nice. They had diamond plate uh, cab floors and were kept clean. 
do control stands, do seats, everything you could want. The CSX crews loved them. And that's probably the same train ducking underneath the CNOTP leaving the yard at Lexington. And this was uh, more than likely a local. Uh, this is an HK tower coming off the EK sub onto the LCL there uh, just outside of Anchorage, Kentucky. And we would say these are BC before Corman. Uh, me and a couple of friends of mine, uh, when we started hearing rumors and then found out for sure that uh, Corman was going to be taking over the old road, and even though we still shot it, you know, it was in pretty much in our backyard, we shot it a lot anyway. We really went to town on it after that. I've got a lot, a lot of pictures. Uh, this is a CSX Lexington yard job somewhere out on the belt line. And this is on the NS again. It's a brown coal train uh, headed to the KU plant there in brown uh, with a uh, set of good looking CSX power. Uh, Lexington local power, Lexington yard power sitting off to the left coming by the, uh, the yard office there at Lexington, which is soon to exist no more. It's gone. It's gone. And this is downtown LaGrange, Kentucky. Uh, this is not that old of an image. I believe, that, uh, I'm trying to remember, this was 2010 or 11. I went up to Summer Rail, uh, me and Chris Starnes, and uh, once again that Sunday, uh, Chris drug me off to places like LaGrange and, you know, places that had funny-looking engines like this on it, but... You still got a few good shots. This is downtown Frankfurt here, I believe. This is Smith's Grove, Kentucky, on uh, what the CSX calls the uh, main stem, main line between Louisville and Nashville. Uh, only shot out there a couple of times uh, coming back home from uh, Nashville and going down to see shows at the Opry, but it was still pretty, uh, pretty busy. Nice old ba uh, battered GE there. I was always happy, even if it was a GE, if it wasn't a wide nose. And this is uh, somewhere in the yard at Corbin. Uh, back when I worked for G&O, uh, one of my extra detailed jobs that I had, uh, the company's owner, Pete Clawson, had a couple of business cars, uh, private varnish that were Amtrak certified, but he used to send them around to all of our properties to visit. And uh, he always wanted an escort, escort to go with the cars, but nobody else in the company really liked to do that because you might be gone two days and you might be gone two weeks. Uh, but uh, I wasn't married back then, and uh, yeah, you want to pay me to go ride your luxurious office car for a couple of weeks? Twist my arm. But uh, this was on a trip uh, going back to Knoxville, taking in Corbin. That was our head in power. And uh, I remember that trip uh, uh, right after we left Corbin, I managed to talk myself up on the head in and got to ride through uh, uh, the gorge and over the Chaska Mountain and everything in the fall uh, on the head in. And here's another one of those, uh, those weird places. Uh, this is uh, Dawson, Tennessee, southbound on the uh, KD sub. Uh, you can see way in the background that little thin bridge. That's the uh, NS uh, K and A crossing back there. The train is just getting ready to uh, dive in Dawson tunnel there. Uh, this is probably in the early 90s, mid, early to mid 90s. Uh, CSX making its away pumpkin with a couple of panel cars, and this is sitting in the uh, uh, set out track at West Frankfurt. Uh, this is a train uh, going towards Lexington, leaving Frankfurt, not too far out of Frankfurt Tunnel, just starting to hit the uh, big hill going up towards Jet. Uh, And surely everybody recognizes this place, or most of you. Uh, that's taken from uh, A Tower at uh, Cincinnati Union Terminal. 
Yeah, the NS Triple Crown crossing the bridge on the uh, CNOTP headed up the hill. You can see the head, head, the head end of it up there at the uh, signals at Ludlow, and uh, CSX job coming in off the uh, CNO or the LNN. And back to Pennsylvania. Uh, this is at Myersdale, Pennsylvania. I don't know uh, how many of y'all are familiar with that area, but uh, at one time the Western Maryland and the CSX kind of crisscrossed each other up from Sandpatch up through the valley there. And eventually the uh, Western Maryland leaped across the valley and the uh, CSX main line on a huge viaduct. And uh, of course the Western Maryland's long gone, but the bridge is still there and they'd made a uh, nice walking trail out of it. And uh, we walked out there on the bridge one after noon and just kind of hung out. You usually didn't have to wait too long for a train to show up. Uh, we'll skip back to Cumberland, Maryland. You know, in Kentucky, we don't have a lot of uh, Amtrak. You got the Cardinal, and that's about it, and it runs mostly in dark both directions. So anytime I was anywhere to shoot Amtrak, I always liked to do it uh, just because it was kind of a Oddity to me, and I always like the F-40s. Uh, but this is the uh, Capitol Limited leaving Cumberland at Viaduct Junction, and a uh, few of the uh, few of y'all might recognize the uh, lady in the blue shirt squirt, uh, squatted down there taking her own picture. That's my mom. <laughs> this is the eastbound train leaving Cumberland. Uh, at a place they call the slide, and you can see why they call it the slide. There's a absolutely old and humongous uh, limestone quarry just back around that curve, and uh, that scar has been on the hill as long as I remember. But that's not where they had uh, done any quarry or mining. That's where they took so much out of the bottom of the hill that the hill finally slipped. And to this day, that scar is still there. You can see it from the interstate for miles. Anybody want to take a guess of where this is at? It is Louisville. We're at Louisville. Baxter Avenue. A lot of people might not know this, but at one time, uh, l and ran some commuter trains around Louisville, and this was one of their suburban stations at Baxter Avenue, which is, but is, uh, uh, Evan, was it MN Tower? Yeah, uh, this is a derby train coming into Louisville. Uh, Eric Landrum and myself went up there. Uh, not a place you really wanted to go with more than one person, and you probably felt safe with we four or five, and especially with uh, and having a little friend in your pocket just in case, which we did. But uh, the only thing I ever shot there, but it was worth it. I don't believe that structure is standing anymore. That's still there. Is it? And I didn't bore you with too many signs, but I always like shooting signs, especially safety signs. NSs were always kind of eh, bland. CSX had uh, some really good ones. Uh, I don't think I've got any pictures in this show, but like leaving Cumberland, uh, they had a set of Burma Shave signs leaving the Cumberland eastbound, going up through the uh, Narrows. This is uh, entering the KD sub. Now this is going to get to back to a more modern era. This is 2015. Uh, a friend of mine that used to work uh, for CSX back then, he was one of their uh, instructors at the Ready down in Atlanta. He was probably one of the best locomotive mechanics and electricians I've ever known. He's, he's forgotten more than all these new guys know. And uh, he was going to be in Corbin doing some training, and he called me a couple of days before, and... Uh, he said, uh, it's going to be kind of quieter in the shop Sunday. He said, if you'll drive down here, uh, you can have the run of the shop for the day. And, of course, I took him up on it, and he told me to bring a few people with me, and I made a few phone calls, but I couldn't, they couldn't get anybody to go with me even for that. So I went and spent all day uh, down there with him shooting. We had to run to the place. We were on top of the building, on the, in the pits, everywhere else. And uh, 
Unfortunately, he did not know, and I did not know either, that in less than two months, Corbin would cease to exist. It was about three weeks after I shot this series of pictures that the employees got their notice that they were closing the shop. Modern, a clean, good shop, uh, and busy. They had, I mean, there wasn't anything from wreck repair to, to minor repairs they couldn't do there. And uh, just, uh, you know, how people in eastern Kentucky, southern Kentucky, they're very proud. And those guys were happy, didn't know me from Adam, but they were happy to see me uh, take an interest in what to do. I took a bunch of people pictures, which I've, I've not included in this just because I didn't have permission to use any of them. But, uh, you know, it made you feel good to go down there and have these guys willing to show somebody they don't, didn't know. Uh, this is uh, one of the experimental CSX air conditioner mods. <laughs> I understand uh, it uh, did not make it past a signal. I believe that's what it was. Now, this is in the uh, what they call the mod shop down there. At the time I was down there, they were still hot and heavy uh uh, doing uh, PTC conversions on their locomotives and uh, this uh, one shop was kind of an open air and of course the electricians uh, couldn't have the locomotive for the air conditioner running so uh, they come up with an ingenious way to stay cool while they were running wires but I thought it made for a neat picture anyway uh, there's a good old CSX number one off to the right uh, with a good looking butt head off to the left All right, now we're going to go uh, back over on the uh, LC, L sub, the short line between Louisville and Cincinnati. This is a northbound train crossing the uh, Kentucky River, River coming into Worthville. Uh, I was really surprised this shot came out as good as it did because it was a cloudy day. It, it, it was CSX, so it was a cloudy day. But uh, that's a heck of a tele shot and uh, came out a lot better than I expected. And the train you just seen, this is at uh, down in the valley at uh, Glencoe. Uh, two trains meeting. And if you can see in the fog and the mist, on the right-hand side of the screen up towards the top uh, horizon right before the trees end, can you all see that highway bridge? All right, that highway bridge spans where Eagle Tunnel we used to be up there, the tunnel that collapsed and they had the daylight. So that, and uh, it's only about three miles from there to underneath that bridge. If that gives you the kind of uh, uh, idea of the grade uh, they have to fight uh, going the other direction, coming out of the uh, Licking uh, River Valley there, it's, it's always been a show coming up that hill. And this is taken standing on the bridge I was just talking about. Uh, this is a uh, Cincinnati bound train. Uh, Coming around the curve, you can see Glencoe, and way back in the valley, Sparta, uh, in the background. And the old entrance to the tunnel is probably just four or five car lengths uh, in front of the train there. Uh, they had a really bad accident. I forget what year it was. That tunnel had been uh, prone to collapse a couple of times before, and they'd shortened it and shortened it. And then it caved in, uh, I believe... Uh, on a train uh, several years ago, so after they got the mist cleaned up, they just went in and daylighted the thing and uh, got rid of it. Huh? Eight, yeah, seven, seven or eight. One of my more favorite CSX shots, and I can't believe I'm saying that, but there it is. Uh, this is also on the LCL sub, uh, of the, the uh, short line. Train uh, coming up uh, Banklick Hill, coming underneath the CNO Bridge at Walton. And SpongeBob bringing a train down the valley. Uh, Tyler, are you in here? Tyler Harden? Oh, I believe that's at Sparta. I could be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and I. Don't remember this location here. Uh, this 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 was a digital shot back uh, around 2011 or 12. One of our trips home from the Opry uh, on a Sunday. I always follow the CSX back home, and uh, this is uh, somewhere just north of the Kentucky uh, Tennessee state line. 
Now here's a shot I'm real proud of, and I was telling some of the guys when we were looking at uh, <laughs> looking through some of these pictures uh, before everybody came in. Uh, every time I've showed this particular image on Facebook, any of the locals around here, I don't know how many people have tried to figure out where I took this from. And people that live in Frankfurt couldn't figure it out. And it was taken up on Armory Hill. Uh, this was a Sunday morning. Uh, the Derby train had come back to uh, Frankfurt that night and unloaded. And here you see they've shoved back out onto the main, getting ready to go to Lexington and uh, cross the CSX main to go uh, back to Jacksonville. But uh, I've not seen that angle of downtown Frankfurt from anybody else. CSX Derby train uh, under a coat of chrome sky. Uh, that's a place called Croppers, which is just uh, in between, well, it's in between Baghdad and Shelbyville. Uh, there's a family that owns that farm right there that I guess they're pretty used to being in, invaded on Derby Day now. Uh, I, uh, I always made a point when I went up there, I went up to the house first and asked permission and every you know, did the right thing, and I never got turned down. And uh, I noticed in later years and years we hadn't shot there. They were there after I shot it a couple of years, and people seen these shots. Uh, you, know, you go by there looking for another place, and there'd be 40 or 50 people out on these guys' farm, and in the soybean fields and the hay fields. Mm -hmm. And you know, I doubt very highly anybody asked permission, but uh, uh, it's one of the days we had it just about to ourselves. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Well, we ain't got to the steam yet, but this is better. Mark, go back one. Uh, this is a digital shot. Now, a lot of what you're seeing is slides, but I did, inc did include a lot of digital stuff. Uh, just personally, I thought uh, uh, some of my work that I've done since I went digital I, I, that couldn't be passed up. This is one of my uh, favorite NS shots. It's not on the NS. This is uh, a uh, NS coal train that was headed to the uh, Kingston TVA power plant down in Tennessee. And it's loaded on the uh, Paducah at Louisville at Armstrong Mine. And this is a place, place called uh, Spring Lake, Kentucky. And uh, you can't see it in this particular frame. I have another frame where you can see... Uh, all the head end power, 120 loads, and two DPs on the rear. If there's not many places in the state of Kentucky, you can see a whole train like that. But uh, this was uh, literally two minutes before the sun was gone, and I, I was uh, just very pleased with the way this came out. Now here's an oldie but a goodie. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. That's my hometown. And I didn't have much choice other than to like trains uh, starting uh, from an early age. My dad was a uh, avid HO modeler. He had a large layout uh, in our uh, big attic at the house. Uh, and I enjoyed the models, but I kind of liked the real thing better. Uh, but this is the, uh, this has been on Derby Day, 1988. Uh, with the uh, Southern FP7s bringing the Derby train through town at a uh, pretty good clip uh, just before dark. And I can still remember standing there with my dad uh, watching it come through town and that M5 horn just cutting through the crossings all the way through town. And, you know, it's just something to see. And, uh, of course, the depot's gone now. Uh, the F units are gone now, but uh, that was just kind of a taste of what I grew up with there. That that was home. I spent way too much time as a kid in my ten, you know, as a when I was in school, hanging out after school uh, there at the depot. Got to know the local crews, got to know the regular operator. And when I was 12 or 13 years old, I probably knew more about writing 19 R train orders than anybody my age needed to know. But that's what I wanted to do. So the GP35, I believe, the Lexington Yard job. 
uh, doing uh, some switching uh, at, on the power plant lead at Brown. That would have been around 1989, 1990. Huh? Updated your clicker over there. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, this is a pair of yard engines on the uh, north end west uh, yard job at uh, Danville back when they used to host host to host. Uh, they had uh, four yard jobs usually work in the yard at one time. One on the north and south end of the east and west yard. Uh, and there was always uh, either uh, SW 1500 or a couple of Jeeps. That's good old days you can see. Now here's also a shot I doubt very many people have seen uh, I guess most people know where the Osram Savannah plant is over in Uh When I worked for the Lexington, Ohio, Osram Savannah was our largest customer. Uh, we had a lot of customers, but Osram by far paid the bills. And uh, uh, at the time the LNO was running, uh, they only got inbound uh, inbound material like. Uh, limestone and uh, cyanide and dolomite stuff, all the stuff they used to make light bulbs with. And this, the stub of this track you see here was in there, but that track came down the hill, they called it the dock track, and uh, there's a warehouse just off the left there that would hold about eight boxcars. This time they were shipping uh, fluorescent light bulbs out of there in boxcars before they uh, switched over to trucks. And the uh, Lexington Yard job that came out to for sales uh, every day, they spent probably three or four hours uh, shuff you know, shuffling empties and loads around and working uh, those two tracks. And they also had a track they called the gas track where they got propane deliveries to keep their uh, uh, furnaces running. And, uh, of course, Osram now is gone. The plant there is not anymore. Uh, Corman, I don't believe has any business out there unless somebody happens to maybe move into some of the industrial land out there. Uh, but, uh, and here's the same train, uh, K-22, it was leaving, uh, this is, I don't believe, uh, this has been a few months later. It's kind of hard to tell them black and white, but there's snow on the ground. This is coming up to the Elm Street crossing, uh, coming into downtown Versailles, uh, just off the sewer plant bridge. And another thing I grew up as a child seeing, uh, of course, were the uh, mid-train uh, helpers Southern had uh, with the... Uh, the uh, remote control cars and the engines that were set up for local control. Uh, across the Louisville district, they ran at least two trains each way that were heavy enough to require one or two engines in the uh, middle. And of course, that time, all the electronic gear wasn't built into the locomotives. So that car you've seen behind the engine, uh, they called it a cracker box. And it had the remote control gear in it uh, and air brake gear. It basically, and it, you emued that to the locomotive you wanted to control or locomotives, and the head end had a special control box that sits on top of the, uh, uh, usually the air brake uh, stand, uh, separate from the control stand. So unlike today's DPs where you can set it up in the fence mode or whatever, where the uh, DPs will just follow whatever you do on the head end if you want to, Back in this day, the engineer had to run basically two sets of engines. He had uh, his head in, and then he had uh, push button controls for uh, brakes and throttle uh, to control the uh, mid train units. And here's a rare bird. Mark, what was that you said? U33 Hyatt. I only remember seeing two or three of those uh, ever in Southern paint, and this was probably in the early to mid 80s. They were, uh, that time the CNOTP was uh, pretty much just EMD products, uh, but I always thought these engines were just cool looking because you didn't see many GEs with a high hood, and it just kind of gives it that, gives it a brutish, powerful look to me. 
Now we can tell some stories. And I was telling y'all about, uh, I grew up in Larchburg, Kentucky. Uh, and there was a, a local crew that worked five, sometimes six days a week out of Larchburg. Uh, of course, they work all the mainline industries between Harrodsburg and Shelbyville, everybody around Larchburg. But at that time, the uh, western end of the LL branch uh, was in between Larchburg and out to Tyrone. And in the milepost three on that bridge, there was a, a Cedar Brook Bridge. How many of y'all seen uh, the Kentucky River Bridge at Tyrone? A few of you? Yeah. Joe's, Joe's jumped off of it, in case you want to know, uh, with a rubber band with a rubber band tied around his leg. Uh, at that time, the only thing they could use uh, power-wise because of Cedar Brook Bridge which was actually built lighter and flimsier than the Kentucky River Bridge, uh, were SW1s. And uh, the 102 called Larchburg home the whole time I was a kid. The only time it wasn't there if it went to Chattanooga or Louisville for fuel or inspections, and they would substitute another SW1 in. We got some uh, N and W and nickel plate oddballs in there every once in a while, but it was usually the 1002 and the 1007. And uh, they went out to the Wild Turkey Distillery eh, two, sometimes three times a week. Here she is looking not as good, but still looking good in the in this paint. But uh, funny story about the branch line. Uh, last year or two that they ran, that bridge, the crews were so scared of that bridge. To start off with the uh, loads they took out to the uh, distillery, uh, they were 286,000-pound cars that were loaded to around 100,000 pounds, you know, about half. Because, and uh, even though I, it was sorely against the rules, and I know the officials knew they'd do it, because I've stood there and watched watched them do it with an official watching, uh, they would shove the load for the distillery out the branch ahead of the engine. They'd get out to Cedar Brook, conductor would get off, walk across the bridge, and then the brakeman would... Uh, have the engineer kick the car across the bridge. Uh, the conductor would catch it down to the end, put a brake on it, and then they'd bring the engine across and a couple back up and go the rest of the way to the distillery. That's a partial view of the bridge I'm talking about, Cedar Brook. Not a very good shot. It shows it's a flimsy, but you can see how rusty it is. And it's bent. And this here was home to me, you know, the SW1 setting on the uh, west leg of the Y of the depot in the background. Bob King, who was a track inspector, his motor car sitting on the set out, set out track out there. Mainline trains rolling through there about every 45 minutes. Uh, here's the 1012 which I believe is owned by Oak Ridge. Am I right about that? Is that the engine Charlie Poland's got? It's, I don't remember. It's either him or, or Tan W's got something right now. Okay, well, KLW's got the 02 and the 07. Okay. Yeah. I believe that's the one Charlie Poland's got that they, uh, it's at Stearns right now. It, uh, there's been some pictures released of it uh, while it was at Stearns. Uh, as backup power for some of the big South Fork uh, engine while well, they were doing some maintenance on that and to repay them for use of the engine, uh, they repainted it into the uh, green and gold Southern switcher scheme. 1988, the butt shop in Chattanooga. A little bit of everything in there, a lot of Southern, a lot of SD50, GP30s, GP35s. Now here's a truly, truly rare bird. Uh, this was a, uh, uh, I done went blank, GP49, right Mark? 50. 50. 49. 59. 59, that's right. Uh, 
back in the early 90s, Norfolk Southern bought the uh, demonstrators for the GP59s from Norfolk Southern and the or from EMD leasing. And the first four that EMD made in the effort to try to play with aerodynamics and fuel saving and whatnot and so forth, uh, if you look at the uh, edges of the cab, you'll notice they're rounded, they're not square. And there were four of those units built like that, and NS wound up buying all of them. They've probably been turned into eco units or scrap by now, but uh, this is coming, uh, starting down Moreland Hill uh, at the 127 crossing there at Moreland, Kentucky on the CNOTP. It's the only good shot I've got of that. I've got some roster shots of them up in Chicago at the Grange when they were still in the EMD demonstrator paint. What's that? Yep. That's coming through uh, Harrodsburg, also known as Hogtown. If you hear, hear us talk about Hogtown or read that on Facebook, it's Harrodsburg. Uh, I guess a, uh, a bad uh, nickname from uh, all the uh, animal processing used to be done there. Of course, the town I grew up in also had a nickname when I was growing up, and they called it Sewer City because our sewer plant wasn't that much. Um, I'll digress. Westbound crossing Poplet uh, Trestle uh, at Fisherville. The yep. That's the, that's the one mean you sat under and slept for like four hours waiting on the wall bash that morning. And this is the eastbound on the uh, Louisville District uh, at the uh, Middle Road Cross and Providence Road in the siding at Talmadge, which is in Mercer County. By the way, nice fence at Van Arsdale. You used to like to lean on to uh, take pictures. Got wiped out by a fire truck yesterday. Oh. Ouch. It went across the crossing and wound up on its roof sliding down the road. Wow. Nobody hurt. The fire truck was seriously injured. Mm. That's good. Nobody was hurt. This was after 4610 got painted, uh, repainted for the second time into the uh, uh, Southern Green and Gold. Uh, her second week out of the shop at Chattanooga after they repainted it, uh, we were lucky enough to have it on the local at Lawrenceburg for two weeks. Uh, I think we all had enough of it by then because I, I took way too many pictures of it. And... Uh, of course, it doesn't exist anymore. Here is uh, southbound uh, 215, climbing the Kentucky River uh, Hill, coming out of the valley there uh, at Brown, Kentucky, coming into Bergen. The track going up the hill to the right is the lead to the KU power plant. Uh, after the F units and before the OCS, uh, NS used to uh, run their uh, derby trains, uh, usually with a nice set of good-looking Jeeps. Uh, here's a nice match pair uh, with the derby train headed into Louisville in the evening sun at Waddy, Kentucky. Let's see, Casey, here's a cloudy day in this shot. <laughs> uh, this is Nemo, Tennessee. Uh, if you've never been to Nemo, it's one of those places you should visit once, but you're not just going to accidentally find it. You've got to know where you're going. And after a recent incident down there, they plastered the place with no trespass. Yeah. Not just one or two, I mean, they plastered it. Everywhere. This was a uh, TVRM Autumn Leaf Special. I don't remember what year, 91, 92 maybe. Uh, they ran Autumn Leaf Special from Chattanooga up to... Uh, uh, Harriman Junction, uh, Tennessee, and the first day 4501 went lame, so they wound up having a couple of diesels on it, and the next day we had the steam on it. And here's another kind of rare sight. This was uh, one of the last trains uh, before uh, the company I worked for, the Lexington, Ohio, took over the LL branch between Lexington and Versailles. Uh, this was one of the very last NS trains 
they had ran out there. This is coming across what we affectionately called the uh, sewer plant bridge uh, in downtown Versailles. And this is during the uh, elections in Ohio days. Uh, the selection yard job, they just have shoved a big interchange cut down to us. And that track that we were putting in off to the left, well, we rebuilt that back into Alvin Haynes trucking. And uh, we picked up a business handling salt cars out of Detroit. Uh, NS brought us salt cars. We kept an engine in Lexington all the time because that track would only hold about 10. And they unloaded usually 20 to 30 salt cars a day in the dump trucks and hauled them to Fayette County to the different road garages. Still <laughs> Y'all still get those DSX, DSX cars with the non-existent brakes? Uh, one of my favorite diesels that the Southern NS ever had was the GP50s. I can remember on a CNOTP or even a hot train like 229, which has always been the hottest thing out there, would have three or four GP50s on it. And uh, this is the class unit. Uh, this was actually at Waddy, Kentucky. It's actually 40X. 40X. Thank you, Bart. Hey, that's why I pay you the big bucks. <laughs> This is a westbound starting down uh, Wadi Hill. You can kind of see, it's uphill in the Wadi both directions. They're fairly steeply. You can see the summit of the hill back there just where the train starts to turn off to the right. And they still the Yep. Uh, this was just west of where I grew up in Lawrenceburg. Uh, this is the west end of Coal Chute Siding. You can't get this shot anymore because there's a couple of factories down in that valley now, but uh, there used to be, uh, the bridge is still there, a nice little uh, metal bridge uh, over a creek there. It used to be quite photogenic back in the day. And here's an oldie but goodie. This would have been 88 or 89. Uh, this is uh, another, one, another one of those places a lot of you probably never heard of in a little district called Avonstoke. Avonstoke is between uh, the big city of Alton and Wadi, uh, down to the bottom of the hill crossing uh, uh, Benson Creek. A friend of mine off to the left there, Stephen Walker, we used to go out in the evening sometimes uh, shooting trains in the summer. Uh, I think that's the, actually the only shot of the bridge down there I ever had. Southbound at Kings Mountain. Got a little bit of ice back in the cut. And I was talking about Nemo a few minutes ago. This is also at Nemo, southbound. Popping out of the tunnel crossing the uh, Emory River. Me and Gordon and a few others of us used to go down to Nemo and camp for a week at a time and just watch trains and drink. Drink beer and shoot guns and. This is a northbound uh, on the CNOTP, uh, starting around a big curve at Palm, getting re getting ready to uh, come out on a single track to come up the hill towards Moreland. And this is a uh, eastbound derby train depart or out of Louisville. And this is back when the derby train used to be occupied. Uh, now when NS sends the cars to uh, Louisville, it's a deadhead move. And uh, deadhead move, and they're uh, only used as a hotel while they're down there, but it used to be the officials rode to town and came back on the train all the way from and to Atlanta. And uh, back during this period, it would have been occupied. And nice uh, GP50 pacing shot at uh, Wadi. 
believe that's also on the derby train that we were just looking at. Another one of those hard to get to CNOTP places. This is Camp Austin. It's not really hard to get to. There's a paved road all the way, believe it or not. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, way, way north, it seems like, uh, out of Oakdale. you got to drive forever to get there. And once you cross the tracks, and there's a nice several million dollar new bridge across the Emory River, and then the road dead ends. And, you know, we've all got used to, back when they were still running, seeing the triple crowns with two, sometimes three big six axle of GEs on it. But uh, for several years after they started the triple crown service, uh, normal power would be a, a Jeep 50 or maybe a, a Jeep 60, a hot rod, and usually 50 to 75 trailers. And uh, they slowly grew that into a maximum of 150 trailers. There's another one uh, just has, it's coming up the hill, Norwood Hill, uh, leaving Somerset, a place called Cumberland Chair. And that is a southbound um, uh, near Gratison, Kentucky. Another triple crown crossing uh, a creek down there, a tributary of the Emory River. Uh, we were camping down in Nemo, and I had always wanted to shoot this bridge, and having been through there on a the train a bunch, it didn't seem like it was that far from Nemo to this bridge. And uh, it, we, we, we left camp early one morning when it was, wasn't very hot. Me and a couple of the guys, we hiked down there, and it seemed like it was maybe three or four miles, not too bad. We hung around shot trains to about noon, and then the temperature and humidity come up, and it seemed like it was about 25 miles back to camp. Nice intermodal southbound coming through the uh, swag there at the top of Moreland Hill. Single track on the CNOTP, just south of uh, Junction City and Bowling. Uh, another another snowy shot. Uh, this was not too long before the uh, depot at Marchburg was moved to where it is now. You'll notice the uh, train number semaphore is gone, and the building hasn't been painted for a while. It's in a little rough condition. Uh, I believe it was probably no more than a couple of years after this that they wound up uh, moving the building out to the other side of town and making a, a produce market out of it. Uh, night shot, an old night shot, back when I'm, I used to like to play with that kind of stuff, but just with ambient light, Marsburg Depot. And this is what it looked like uh, just before they moved the building. Uh, the people that bought it uh, restored it just to cut it in half and move it. And, uh, but they put it back in its original colors. And I'll give my mom credit for these shots of the depot being moved. I was uh, working down in Knoxville for the KXHR at that time and couldn't make it up. It's after they'd ripped out the dock behind the depot, eastbound train coming by. And then after the depot was gone, a high wide special coming through westbound. I'm standing right in the middle of where the depot would have been there at one time. And we'll move along to the Star City for a minute. Back when Roanoke was a lot, lot busier. You got a couple of yard jobs, three yard jobs there, probably a main line. Looks like a rail train uh, departing on the main line there. Roanoke was also one of those places back when coal was king that it didn't matter where you went or what line and direction you went out of there. You were always guaranteed to find something to shoot. Anybody know where that's at? That's right. 
more specifically, bottom of Saluda Mountain at Melrose, Melrose, North Carolina. Gordon and myself and a few others made several trips up there uh, in a year or two before they closed the mountain and would spend three or four days and kind of camp out down to Melrose and and, uh, and shoot trains. There was usually anywhere from three to four movements on the mountain a day. The three or four movements, two of those going up the mountain, uh, of course, they had to triple and sometimes quadruple the hill depending on how much weight they had. So you could spend four hours shooting the same train and never get the same shot of it twice. And this is a place called Deep Hollow or Dark Hollow, depending on who you talk to. It's at uh, roughly mile post 172. And this was uh, back uh, before 1995. This area was double tracked. Uh, the NS, one of the first capacity improvements they did on the CNOTP in Kentucky, they double tracked between Tateville, which is right south of Burnside, uh, up to KD Tower, up this hill. Uh, this hill is about 12 miles long, uh, right at one, per, right under one percent, and uh, for southbound trains, and it was a real bottleneck for heavy trains. And this is the Iron Triangle, Fostoria, Ohio. I don't remember what year this is. It was probably in the early 2000s. 1998. 98. It's a uh, a uh, coal train coming down Saluda Mountain uh, in the vicinity of Sand Cut. Yep, this is Bowen, Kentucky, southbound train uh, coming out on single track uh, after a light snowfall. Bowen used to be one of my favorite places around Danville to shoot because it didn't matter what time of the day you were there, you had good sun in at least one direction or another for southbound and it was down in that valley a nice open area and unfortunately now the hippies have moved in and built a hemp processing plant which 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 blocks all the good shots from uh, the east side of the tracks they don't even use it it's closed <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> nice trio emds bringing a uh, manifest up uh, the mountaining mountain at Lansing, Tennessee, the ruling uh, uh, northbound grade on the CNO TP. It's uphill from pretty much Camp Austin all the way uh, up to Sunbright, but uh, in between CW Tower and Lansing is the steepest part of it. Uh, a train was with a good uh, horsepower to tonnage ratio. Uh, when they come underneath the block there at Lansing. Uh, they were probably only making three or four mile an hour and hope they didn't have any bird crap on the rail. Yeah, that's nice. A different view of Kings Mountain. Uh, this is down towards the north end. Uh, I can hear that photo. <laughs> southbound coming down the mountain. Uh, been, uh, with the sunlight the way it is, it's been very late in the day. Uh, that's not a spot you can shoot, but for two or three months out of the year, uh, in the middle of summer and very late in the afternoon. Back to back to Roanoke, and uh, for those of you that like uh, special EMDs, if you'll notice, that is a uh, SD50S, uh, which was. Uh, I believe, uh, if I remember right, built on a SD40 frame, SD40-2 frame. It was some of the uh, test beds for the uh, SD50 units. Norfolk Southern had five of them. This is just north of Whitley City, Kentucky, on the scene of P. In the uh, snow, a place called Marsh's Siding. And this is uh, Parker's Lake, Kentucky. Uh, the control point on the railroad uh, back around the curve there is called Cumberland Falls. Uh, but uh, this is also the uh, where uh, Tunnel 11 used to be 
located the uh, track and the cut there replaced tunnel 11. And uh, one end of the tunnel 11 is still there, but the other got other end of it got buried uh, when they rebuilt Highway 27 going up the hill there. Rainy, foggy morning uh, northbound at Science Hill. Not downtown Science Hill, but uh, the, the intermediate signal they call Science Hill there to 151.1. .1. And uh, started about 2010 or 11 uh, when we realized that they were going to be probably getting rid of all of the uh, old signals on the CTF, CNOTP. I made it kind of a personal project of mine to try to shoot every CP and uh, intermediate that still had searchlights uh, just to document it because I always loved the old signals. Uh, a lot of those had been there since the steam era, uh, you know, parts replaced or whatever but they were all uh, solid state and you know they just didn't wasn't much to go wrong in them uh, and they were much more photogenic than these plastic and shiny aluminum things they've got out there today <laughs> running uh, westbound on the Louisville district running along uh, town branch creek in Harrodsburg And here's a shot, another shot today you can't get for a couple of reasons. This is a westbound train, uh, one, one snowy morning, uh, probably 89, 1990, coming across the uh, bridge across Elmo Head Creek, uh, which is uh, pretty much in downtown Shelbyville. Uh, that bridge has been totally replaced uh, with, uh, as, with a concrete bridge and a ballasted deck and the building I was standing on top of a, a rickety old fire escape to shoot that and uh, that building's gone now too uh, back in the day when it was a lot easier to get up on the bluffs over the uh, lake at uh, Burnside it is now uh, wasn't much of a climb you just had to worry about rattlesnakes uh, Coming across the Cumberland River Bridge there, crossing the uh, lake at Burnside. Don't forget the best ticks. <laughs> Copperheads, uh, rattlesnakes, ticks. In the same location. East Harrisburg, Kentucky. Not a very photogenic shot, but Mark threw it in there. And anybody that knows me well knows that if I have a choice between going out and shooting on a bright sunny day or a day when it's either snowing or pouring rain, I'm going out in the snow or the rain and stay at home on the sunny day. Uh, I've always liked shooting in bad weather. And uh, this is one of those typical southern Kentucky uh, almost snowstorms. This is uh, Junction City, probably around 1995 or so. little closer shot of the one you've seen before nice sd40-2 coming down through the cut there southbound at junction city coming underneath the signals uh, you can see the little white fence over there uh, the train is getting ready to cross it's, well, of course it wasn't there anymore but the uh, what used to be the diamond across the uh, L and N, the uh, branch, uh, the uh, Lebanon branch, and uh, right, right there used to be a, uh, just a busy little area. Uh, Southern Railway and L and N shared a depot. Uh, there was an interlocking tower there, and just to the left of that uh, white plank fence was the old Junction City Hotel, which stood up until uh, about 15 years ago. Back when uh, the railroad used to be a little bit more fun, every Christmas the Employees uh, Association uh, at Danville and other terminals, uh, you know, on a Saturday before Christmas, you brought your kiddos 
uh, to the yard, and uh, Santa would come riding in a train and meet with the kiddos and give them gifts and say ho, 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 and get back on the train and take off. Uh, this is uh, 4th Street in uh, Louisville, one of those places in Louisville where you probably don't want to go by yourself after dark. Uh, it be a uh, eastbound train. And I have often said, if I never, if I had a, never took another picture at this place, at this location here, I'd been fine. And I really preferred at least had a dime for every picture I did take here. Uh, this is a place called North Wide, just north of Danville, with the Louisville District and the CNOP, CNOTP meet up between North Wide and SJ Tower. And uh, there used to be a little bridge across the tracks there. And you know, those lazy days where you didn't feel like driving 300 miles and chasing something and you just kind of want to go hang out and relax, that was always a good place to do it, and it was always busy. And don't forget Mona and the and the raccoon. Coming southbound, coming around the big curve at uh, Palm, uh, just has come out on double track there, and both the trains still coming hard down uh, Moreland Hill. And if they're lucky, they've uh, got good signals, and they'll be able to keep their momentum up because in about another five miles, they'll be starting up uh, Kings Mountain. Another shot of Pope Lake, that a little boy at Fisherville. <laughs> nice old GE uh, popping out of uh, South End of Nemo Tone. Another, yeah, another good-looking older EMD uh, coming down Moreland Hill, just across the 127 crossing at Moreland in a nice little snow. That uh, shot there is uh, uh, off. At that time, it was the uh, new 127 bridge where they built a bypass around the old 127. Uh, back before all that grew up, it wasn't a bad shot, and, and that's just horribly grew up now. This is an election in, uh, just south of CP Fayette. Uh, this is up in Indiana on the middle division. Uh, I believe it's around, uh, I want to say English, Indiana. If anybody can correct that, let me know. But I believe it's English, Indiana. Uh, there's two or three daylighted tunnels up in that area. They start to come down through the uh, escarpment into Louisville. But uh, that's a scene that rivals a lot of places on the scene OTP for scenery. And in Indiana, there's a, a very tall bridge over the tracks there. And uh, I've shot there several times. It was also one of those places just to kind of go and hang out. Well, let's move back up into the uh, Great White North for a minute. This is one of those trips that I was telling y'all about that Eric Landrum drug me kicking and screaming to places like Michigan and Ohio and Indiana. This is on the outskirts of Toledo, Ohio, a Lexus Tower, which uh, is where the nickel plate uh, crossed the uh, Ann Arbor. The Ann Arbor actually controlled the tower. And it just shot uh, this time here, it was 93 or 94, the tower was still uh, manned. It was closed several weeks after this. But uh, nice old C-39 coming up the hill at uh, East End Tucker coming into Louisville. Rear of the train still probably hanging out on Pope Lake Bridge there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I forgot about that uh, lawnmower man. 
southbound coming under the CP at uh, Georgetown before the uh, control point was relocated. This is the original place that they'd been for years and years and years, and they wound up having to move it uh, south, the crossover signals and everything south of uh, here about a half mile uh, to facilitate a uh, new bridge and uh, some road construction they did there. Uh, I always liked this spot because they were just healing into a curve there and there's lots of different ways to shoot it. Standard old King's Mountain shot. Y'all get tired of these in a minute. GE, keeping your local fire department busy since 1898. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's good to have friends that work out there. Uh, I remember we started uh, following this train at uh, Lawrenceburg, and I'll protect the innocent because they're still working, but the uh, guy that was the engineer on it, had seen us at Lawrenceburg and made fire and then come over and yelled out the window and said, come to Wadi. <laughs> I wasn't planning on going to Wadi, but with an invite like that, you know. So he made sure he drug extra slow up Wadi Hill, and once they got uh, started in the siding, uh, he... he right he did this by, by, by throttle modulation and bad design for about four miles. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, that was that engine did not make it to Shelbyville before the fire department actually did have to come and put it out. <laughs> Here's an old shot, 90 or 91, uh, coming through Harrisburg. Uh, I lived 20 some odd years in South Isa and uh, Harrodsburg was just, uh, just down the road. And, uh, if you've never been there, it's just one of those quaint old towns. The railroad's been there. I mean, the town was there a long time before the railroad, but the railroad just kind of took what they wanted when they come to town. So uh, it makes two big giant S curves through town. You get a lot of street running, very sharp curves. Uh, they usually average at least one string line to realm in a year there. Uh, I'm going to guess on a date on this one. I'm going to say probably 90 or 91 because, let's see, this was taken after the uh, second two lanes of the damnable bypass were put in. But uh, it's a southbound pig train leaving Danville on the south main. That's, this is at uh, CP South Danville. At the two main lines off to your right. Uh, the west and trains coming out of the west yard, which just goes off to the left. And uh, there's a running joke amongst rail fans and railroaders alike that know anything about Danville is that you cannot run a railroad in Danville unless you use East Number Six because that's the longest track in the yard. And then you can see the rear end of that other train up there uh, hanging out. That's East Number Six. I've seen them cross trains over at South Danville just to run them up East Number 6 to cross them back over with the manual crossovers of DV Tower. Don't ask me why. Once again, back when GEs were cool, this is pre-1991 or 92 because uh, this is at Lawrenceburg, and you can still see the uh, train order semaphores and, of course, the depot in the background. Christmas time, passing the uh, Ransdell Funeral Home in uh, Harrodsburg. Uh, the last string line derailment they had there started right there going uh, to your left. This is one of my more favorite places on the CNO TP. Uh, yeah, people get me heck all the time about never using wide or medium angle lenses. I like my big glass, and I like places I can use my big glass. Uh, this was uh, pre-digital, 
but uh, this is in Grattison, Grattison Kentucky, uh, with uh, approximately a 640 millim uh, millimeter uh, focal length. And this is uh, coming through a little place called Dead Ox Hollow. Uh, which is down uh, in the Cumberland uh, State Park, right before you get to Whitley City. It's in the middle of nowhere. Dead Ox Hollow is none of those places. Unless you're trying to get there, you're probably not going to find it. I will eventually go there in snow and ice. Take your up. Hey. I've been told. <laughs> uh, loaded uh, coal train coming up Kings Mountain. Uh, this was back also in the early 90s uh, when coal trains out there were actually kind of rare we didn't we didn't see a lot of coal trains you know gordy grew up in Beattyville. it's all he's seen was coal trains on the ek but uh where i grew up we'd see the occasional coal train but it was always a special move and i remember we followed this one for a long way just because it was and nowadays, the CNOT averages probably three to four coal trains a day from the mines in West Virginia, in uh, western and southern Indiana, and off the uh, Baduca and Louisville in uh, western Kentucky. Uh, road rather passing a manifest at uh, Green River Dip. Uh, you all, I haven't showed a picture of this yet, but you all probably seen on Facebook or heard somebody talk about the uh, big trestle of South Fork, Kentucky, just south of Danville. Oh, yeah. That is called, the, that bridge is actually known as the Green River Bridge. Even though the river is not even deep enough or wide enough to get your foot wet. Well, this is about two miles south of there, and this is called the Green River Dip. Uh, oh, probably... 15, 20 trailers back in the uh, Triple Crown there off to the left is the origin of the Green River. It comes out of a spring in uh, Bob Lick Mountain, or Bob Lick, Bob Lick Knob, uh, and a spring up under that, and then, of course, gets a little bit bigger as it flows on down towards Tennessee. Here's another favorite place of mine. Uh, this is a place called Revlo, just south of Stearns. Uh, the big uh, coal loading facility you see there is actually owned by the uh, Kentucky and Tennessee Railway. Uh, they used to bring, and it was a coal washer, coal breaker, and unit train loadout. The K&T would bring uh, coal up there piecemeal and dump it in one of the buildings in the background, and the guys there at the... Uh, that facility would sort it, clean it, break it, whatever it needed to be done. And then when they had a, a silo full in this, would bring a, a unit, tra unit train in there to load. And uh, that hasn't been used since the late 80s. Uh, another one of my uh, favorite uh, artsy farts and shots there in the Louisville district. This is not too far uh, from South Isa where uh, I lived at. Uh, this is a place called Convoy on the railroad, Jackson Pike Crossing. Uh, it's a westbound train coming at us. Uh, they call the Louisville District a gut line. You know, the, uh, the CNOTP has plenty of ups and downs and sharp curves, but uh, the Louisville District was built with even less of a budget and piecemealed together out of two or three different railroads. And they didn't have a lot of money to do cuts and fields and excavations, so they pretty much just followed the, the terrain. And train at this point is a little over a mile away. And uh, standing where I'm standing, uh, the engines will completely disappear down to the bottom of that cut, or down at the bottom of that dip before you start seeing them again. Uh, that's also known as Knuckle Alley. Crossing the uh, CSX and the Corman diving at uh, Shelbyville, the old Bloomfield branch. Well, this was 1992 or 1993. Uh, when was the last time you seen a Conrail Jeep running long hood forward leading a mainline train? 
I can imagine uh, some of these newer crews that somebody handed them that and uh, what they would have to say. But back then, it was just pretty common practice. You took it however they gave it to you. So the Conrail Motors on train 229 coming underneath the signals of Junction City. Uh, northbound Triple Crown 264. This was 2011. Coming underneath the Buster Pike Bridge at North Y there, just north of Danville. Uh, and that's actually the Conrail Heritage Unit. I always thought it was uh, most ironic that, uh, except for the uh, event at Spencer, where we all got to shoot them and see them, the uh, very first Heritage Unit I shot out in the, out in the wild was the Conrail Unit. And uh, it literally had only been about three or four months since we had, when we had shot actual Conroy units. But for coming through uh, Harrodsburg again, uh, that's a slide there. Uh, that's the Lawrenceburg local power there on the right, sitting on the uh, puppy pad at uh, on the west uh, leg of the Y with the. Eastbound train passing with a good old Conroe quality GE leading. Uh, C39-8, uh, Conroe paint, uh, for some reason decided that uh, CSX uh, was getting too much attention with their solid gray paint scheme. So, you know, it's one of the, I think it was one of those, uh, hold my beer and watch this. And they called these Ballast Express train, Ballast Express engines, and we used to see them all the time. And I never seen one on a Ballast train, but I tell you what, on a foggy morning, you couldn't see them at all. Oh, here we go back to Indiana. No, I'm sorry, even worse, Ohio. Uh, it's another one of those uh, Eric Landrum trips where he got me out of my comfort zone. This is a Delta, Ohio. This is where the old DT and I, then the Grand Trunk and the I know today, crossed the uh, New York Central Main Line. Uh, I will admit the first couple of times I went up there, it was neat. We went up there to shoot the uh, DT and I and the Grand Trunk uh, the last uh, couple of years of it, but we would hang out at Delta and much like NS, back then, this is actual Conrail. Conrail had defect detectors about every 10 to 11 miles. Of course, up there in the flatland, you can hear radios forever. So it got to where you could not listen to the road channel on the, on the, in the afternoon because all you would hear was 50 miles either direction, two tracks worth of defect detectors going off. Uh, these trains are running 60 miles an hour and probably on 15-minute headways. Nice set of burners in northern units with a cabless B unit there coming across uh, Burnside Lake, 1989. Nice Santa Fe, uh, well, almost Santa Fe pink bonnet there coming by uh, the old coal tipple at a place called Bear Creek. That's just on the CNOTP just north of Oneida. Interesting factoid. Uh, 4501, uh, back in the day when the original excursion program uh, used that tipple to load coal in a tender a couple of times. I've uh, got a friend of mine that's got some shots taken from that bridge of them uh, loading coal in 4501 there from that tipple. Same train coming around the curb at Parker's Lake. And I will admit, uh, I'm a closet uh, Santa Fe fan. I always like the uh, the war body paint scheme, and uh, even the yellow and the blue weren't that bad. This is Oakdale, Tennessee. Uh, some sort of manifest tied up in the yard over there. This is back when Oakdale was a crew change point in an active yard. Uh, of course, there's not much there anymore except for the main lines and a couple of yard tracks and that's it. And Oakdale used to be a pretty busy, busy place until uh, Birdside killed it. Now here's a fairly rare shot. This is the old Southern Railway dormitory at Burnside. Uh, it it uh, had been closed at this point and was tore down within, 
I want to say six months. I remember the next time. I don't know what made me shoot it because I usually don't shoot Billings, but uh, for some reason I took a shot of it, and we were back down there about six months later, and it was gone. So, uh, and of course, the dormitory here and uh, over in Danville is still standing. It's used as offices for maintenance way at the signal department, but. Uh, it, CP Big Beaver coming under the uh, signals of Georgetown, Kentucky southbound. Nice SD90 Mac. Back when they were new. Amtrak test train. Amtrak test train. Danville, Kentucky. Who would have ever thought about that? And that's actually what it was. That was the. Uh, uh, Back in the when Amtrak was trying to get into the uh, newer high-speed train market, market, you know where we got the Asila now or Sela, however you say it, they borrowed stuff from Japan and Sweden and a couple of other places and played with it out underneath these corridor and more than anything, they put it behind a diesel and towed it around the country, saying, "Hey, this could be us if you give us money." <laughs> Hey, Mark, go back one. And I'll, I'll tell a story about this. I posted uh, a picture of this on a group I'm on on Facebook uh, two or three weeks ago after Casey stand this. I actually, I posted the one with the, had the F-40s in it. And uh, I'm on a group that's got a bunch of uh, uh, the retired dispatchers from the Louisville District, the CNO2P. But... Uh, these guys got to remember this, and uh, they said, yeah. They said, all, all they told us, it was an Amtrak test train, and it was the hottest thing on the railroad. And they said, well, we ran it with a car to crew nonstop from, Cincinnati, or from Chattanooga to Cincinnati without or stopping. And the only at the time they stopped was a change crew to Danville. And 229 was usually the only train that got that kind of treatment. All right, Mark. Now here's something that's kind of rare. Uh, I spent four glorious years working for the Knoxville and Holston River Railway, uh, which was owned by our uh, parent company, the, comp or the company I worked for, the Gulf and Ohio Railways. Uh, I got sent, I got asked to go to Knoxville uh, when they started the KXHR. Uh, by the uh, vice president of operations, and he wanted me to go because they were hiring new people. And uh, they brought a couple guys up from Georgia that had experience, but he wanted me to come down there and spend about six months training engineers for him. So I said, sure, you know, get away from Kentucky for a little while, and then we're in the railroad that's going to pay for everything. And, uh, well, after nine months of living in the Hampton Inn on Merchants Road, I finally talked them into getting me in an apartment and paying for it because it became apparent that I wasn't going home anytime soon. So I spent four down four years down there uh, living on the railroad's dime, and I was sure glad to come back to Kentucky. But uh, during my time down there, one of the neat things I got to do is uh, the old smoky NRHS uh, ran some fall foliage trips from Knoxville out to Asheville. And uh, just because NS was so busy, we originated the trips on uh, the KXHR off the riverfront. And uh, our general manager down there uh, did not want anybody except me touching that train as far as being an engineer. So I spent pretty much two weekends and a week switching cars and private cars and basically learning how to run a GE. Uh, I always told everybody, they handed, NS handed this train over to us in the middle of a thunderstorm in downtown Knoxville about 3 o'clock in the morning. And at that time, I'd already run a bunch of engines. But stuff that were made in the 50s and the 60s, maybe the 70s. And I knew what to expect when I climbed up there. But I tell you what, it was like going from the seat of the Wright Brothers plane to the uh, captain's chair of the Enterprise. <laughs> so uh, here it is, pouring rain, thunder, lightning, wind. And I've got to back uh, 28 uh, 
super lighters and six million dollar plus uh, private cars five miles across our railroad to get it down to where we needed to store it at. But anyway, this was after we'd pulled the train up to uh, spot it for fuel. Skipping around a little bit, this is a CSX Derby train at Frankfurt, uh, sitting on the F and C spur. Uh, it used to be just a dog's breakfast of whatever cars they could get back then. They had uh, some uh, private cars leased. They had Amtrak cars. They had some company cars, stuff from BN. I, I mean, it was just a little bit of everything. This is literally standing in Gordon's front yard and the place I lived for over 20 years is just off the, uh, to the left up the road about a half mile. So, you know, we still had the railroad. <laughs> Even though I moved away from Larchburg, I still had the railroad in the front yard. And it was when I decided to cut the trees and start blowing your ass away. <laughs> That's the... Uh, <laughs> So westbound in the snow, uh, 2014, uh, coming by the uh, east end of Talmadge. Uh, you can't shoot that anymore either. Uh, there's a subdivision that's been built up over there now, and it's full of houses. All right, well, back to the uh, snowy pictures. Uh, here's kind of an artsy fartsy shot of an eastbound train under the Louisville District coming into Nevin Station, uh, which is. And I think most everybody here probably counts themselves as some kind of a railroad photographer. <laughs> what does the big book of photography say about shooting into the sun? Don't do it. Well, or sometimes you just got to throw that book out and see what works. And this was a very, very chilly, frigid Sunday morning northbound wreck train leaving Danville, 60 mile an hour, bringing its own blizzard with it. With it. And uh, I just said, what the heck, I'm going to try it. And I really liked the way it came out. It looked better in black and white than it did uh, color. No explanation given. <laughs> BNSF possum bring a train uh, across the uh, field between Venarsdal and uh, Talmadge, one of the places that was very close to my house that I used to charge a mission for other people to go shoot at. Another kind of odd set. This was 2012 or 13, a Canadian Pacific and a uh, DM and ESD 40 2. If it had been anything other than SD 60, I probably wouldn't have shot it. I wish Tyler was still here because me and him could have told you a good story about this, but I, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I put it this way I've chased a lot of trains on the CNOTP. This was, a, this was a northbound empty grain train. And we shot him here. This is coming through the construction area down between Elihu and uh, Burnside. And we never seen this guy again. He beat us to Danville by 30 minutes. And me driving like I normally drive. But Mongo in the Valley, girl. New York Central Unit coming through the crossovers at... Uh, North Y. Something. Hello, hello. Ah, uh, yeah, might be. Northbound circus train, the uh, red unit of the Ringling Brothers circus train coming through uh, a luckily very empty west yard in Danville is allowed to get that shot. Uh, just not a lot of places you can get that much of a train and shots around here, and I, I really lucked out on that one. This is down, uh, what's the name of that town, Mark? McDonald Farm. McDonald Farm, yeah. 
Sail Creek. Sail Creek. Sail Creek. Yeah. I think I'm actually running right there. Yeah, Casey was actually running the engine here. This was supposed to have been a 6.30 trip from Chattanooga to Oneida, and 6.30 come up lame with a bearing problem or something back in when she was uh, still breaking in, so they gave us the Southern, Southern uh, Heritage Unit, which I was just absolutely tickled about, actually. But uh, I'd never been to this place before. I was actually new to crossing. It was back there by that farm. And uh, driving in there, I happened to notice this scene with the light and the Walden Ridge in the background. And I, said, I don't shoot a lot of wide angles, but I tell you what, I like that. And I really did like the way it come out. Same train with Mr. Thomason flying high across the New River, New River, Tennessee. So another one of these artsy fartsy shots, or excuse me, I'm not stop saying that. I gotta do a Garland McKee AF, but uh, that's, uh, that's one number shy than the from the engine yeah. over here. That is the uh, Larchburg local power reflecting in the window of the old Larchburg Railroad Hotel across the street. Oh my babies. Y'all have no idea how I miss these things. I counted up one time uh, after they'd went away and I was looking at all my shots. I shot the uh, these F units, I think, in 12, 13 different states. I just liked them that much. Southbound uh, coming through Glen Mary, Tennessee, down in the uh, Black uh, Creek Valley early one morning. Uh, southbound deadhead move, and it is a place uh, south of Oneida, Tennessee. The railroad crews call it uh, Tip Top. Uh, it's actually, I can't remember the name, High Point is the name of the signal there. But uh, this is pretty much the highest place on the railroad between Cincinnati and Chattanooga. Theoretically, it's downhill both directions from here all the way. If units coming around uh, Wrong Main on the North Main at DB Tower and Danville one in the fall. Here's one of those uh, shots that you just kind of get lucky with. I was one of these one of those F unit trips that I was chasing, and they were going to be at a Danville early. I went to Kings Mountain, and it was raining and uh, kind of foggy. Can y'all hear me okay? There we go. But uh, this was about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, two trains meeting there at Kings Mountain in the rain and the fog. And here is the actual Green River Bridge at South Fork. Usually a southbound train to head in will go across there at uh, 40 mile an hour track speed. And if they get any kind of length at all by the time the rear end comes by, they're usually down to around 10 mile an hour, sometimes less than that, as they climb up Kings Mountain. Southbound coming out onto single track at Palm with the uh, little GRS signals. This was the last train I ever shot at Kings Mountain under the old signals, and it had to be uh, one of uh, Uncle Warren's engines, but BNSF coming there. This was 229. As soon as 229 cleared, uh, the signal crews and the contractor got uh, track time, and within about an hour, that signal bridge was gone. Uh, uniformity. I always liked uh, unit trains, whether it be ethanol trains or. Uh, Solid unit trains with the same kind of cover hopper. It just always looks so neat in the background, especially in tele shots. This is coming out on uh, double track, uh, taking number two track at Palm Southbound, coming down Moreland Hill. The green and gold coming underneath the signals northbound at South Fork. 
And once again, this is northbound uh, coming into Parker's Lake. Southbound at uh, Bowen, now known as Hippie Farms. Uh, coming under one of two scenic attributes found in downtown Bergen, Kentucky. Uh, there used to be an old picket fence that was laying in the weeds on the other side of the track by the old grocery store that me and Garland McKee used to drag out and set up just to have something to frame a train with. And we'd throw it, we'd throw it back in the weeds. It disappeared, but that tree's still there. Southern unit coming uh, by the signals there at uh, 339.6 at South Vaisa. Actually, where I lived at was just about a no more than a half a mile off to the left, and I'm pretty much standing in Gordy's front yard. And they call it the 339.3 and the 339.4 now. Yeah, they changed it. New signals, new Let's pop over to the K and A between Harriman Junction and Knoxville for a moment. Not the busiest piece of the railroad, but uh, if you find a train out there, it's worth chasing. Uh, you got Copper Ridge Mountain and pushers and uh, bridges and hills. It's a very scenic railroad if you can find something running out there. And believe it or not, it's a little busier today, I think, than it used to be. It's 112 coming by. I don't know if that's, uh, that building was redone as a prop for a movie. Uh, that was shot uh, around, this is Oliver Springs, Tennessee, and that building was uh, uh, redone as a prop for a movie uh, called uh, October Sky, if you all ever seen that. It has 4501 in it. And back to Kentucky, a pair of brand new, got that new engine smell aces making their first trip on a coal train. Uh, it's coming up Wadi Hill. The original Norfolk Southern uh, unit coming around a big curve at Palm. Uh, this is two, uh, let's see, two, 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 two sixteen, crossing Eagle Creek Bridge just north of Sadieville. And here's a shot that I'm pretty proud of, uh, just more because we actually got it. Uh, this is uh, at uh, Tunnel 24 down south of Oakdale, Tennessee. And in my quest to shoot all of the searchlights, uh, I went through a, a mutual friend of ours who got permission to go across the landowner's land. And we went back there one Sunday and spent three or four hours uh, shooting uh, trains. And uh, this is one of my favorite shots. It was a very unique uh signal bridge and uh, three-masted signal on uh, that bridge there. And believe it or not, that's not a control point. Uh, there's trains coming out of one tunnel fixing to go in another, and in between the two tunnels is considered single track, gauntlet track, uh, kind of a, an oddball operation. Virginia unit uh, at uh, McBrayer, Kentucky, on the Louisville District. Uh, the Peebler Blue Hamburger uh, coming by the old IC signals. This is on the P&L main coming into Armstrong, Kentucky, in Western Kentucky. TBA coal train. And same engine again on the P&L main line at Rosine, which... Uh, if anybody here knows anything about bluegrass music, Rosine was the uh, home of the father of bluegrass music, Bill Monroe. Same unit again, uh, Louisville District coming up Wadi Hill eastbound. This was just kind of grab shot one day. It's uh, westbound 22A. Uh, crossing the old road uh, just on the uh, east side of Lawrenceburg. A very, very frigid morning. I remember it was a Sunday morning. Me and Adam Wells went out shooting. 
And when we left the house, it was like negative 15 that morning. But the sun come out and it warmed up to like 3. Uh, but uh, we'd had a lot of ice and snow the night over, and it just made a real neat uh, scene with all the ice and the snow in the trees. Kansas City Bell, even uh, a uh, eastbound through the field there at Bernardsville in the little district. Back to convoy. I always get a lot of uh, response out of these shots. But uh, that's uh, probably a 400, 450 millimeter uh, tele shot at the uh, Big Dip at Convoy, the same place I showed you earlier, the train further away. And this is something kind of rare. This is at uh, be the east end of Talmadge. I don't know, that was, they've changed the names of that stuff. I don't know what they call it anymore, Titan or something. Yeah, but uh, That was a work train tied up in the house track there. Uh, you didn't didn't see anything in that track very often. That track's nowhere near that long now, either. Except for those signals in it and kind of get the length of the track. Uh, 22A again coming up Water Hill behind a lovely EMD, I believe. 60E. 60E, Casey's favorite engine. <laughs> Back to uh, East Talmadge again right after the snow. Work train tied up on the left with the uh, eastbound, soon to be southbound 275 passing. This is West Harrodsburg just before the street running starts. I think we've all took these kind of shots before. Those of us that's run engines at all, you've seen it from the other side, and it ain't, it ain't any fun looking at it that way either. But uh, the telly makes it look a little closer than it was, but, you know, we used to sit there and just wait for somebody to do that. That lady was probably on her way to church. I remember this was on a Sunday morning. Another uh, nice... Kansas City Bell at uh, West Talmadge, heading west. As far as some of the railroads that come out with the retro paint schemes, I always thought the uh, th those Kansas City units were sharp. It's a shame they're gone now. Uh, loaded TBA coal train uh, starting to accelerate out of Harrodsburg at East Harrodsburg. And... Moving around a little bit, this is actually on the CSX on the short line, the LCL, at, uh, I can't remember the name of it, I want to say Sutton. Lady of Liberty coming by the scenic new bridge and plastic lamppost that I think, I think they put there just for me. <laughs> Same spot without all the scenic attributes, uh, just just some uh, sewer water in the creek there. All hell, the mighty Penn Central, I can hear Landrum now. Isn't it resplendent in its Brunswick green? This is a westbound coming down the hill at Avonstoke by the searchlights right before they uh, were taken out. Uh, SD forty dash two leading a uh, rack train up Wadi Hill, and even at this late date, it was kind of odd to see uh, SD forty on anything except the, maybe a low slow drag freight. SD seventy coming over top of Wadi Hill. Virginia. The uh, Virginian unit at Parker's Lake, I threw that one in there just for Tish because she likes wildflowers. Yellow. Same unit again on the Louisville District uh, coming up out of the Salt River Valley at McBrayer. And downtown Lavenstoke again. Reading unit there uh, in the siding at Talmadge getting uh, passed by another train. That's 
getting run around on the Louisville district is kind of odd, but uh, every now and then they would do it. I uh, believe that was 370. Six on the right, which is kind of a, a long road local. It went from Louisville to Cincinnati. Amtrak in Thomasville, North Carolina. On whatever year is it, the uh, big maroon thing ran for the first time. The Amtrak Cardinal at Battleground, Indiana, just outside of Indianapolis, 2014. This was uh, Amtrak Power on the, the American Association of Private Rail Car Owners uh, special. Uh, they went to St. Louis. I forget where they come out of. Maybe they came out of the north, so maybe Chicago. But they ran to St. Louis, and uh, one of the few times you ever see uh, any Amtrak on the Louisville District. Coming down through uh, the horse farms at uh, Clark Station, Kentucky. Uh, just the other side of Shelbyville. Crossing the new bridge there to M.O. Head Creek in Shelbyville. In the pouring rain. And some of the look at some of the private cars. And then Casey, I know you told, uh, told me to hurry up, but... Uh, anyway. I think the story needs to be told. This will get a good one. So, is this 2014 or 15? Uh, 14, I believe. 2014, it was June or July, it was a Friday night. Uh, they were getting ready to run some uh, steam trips out of Bristol. I had worked all day, had every plan of going home, uh, sleeping until about midnight, and uh, me and uh, Gage O'Dell were going to meet and drive to Bristol after midnight to be in position for the steam trip when the sun came up. And I hadn't even made it, been able to lay down yet when uh, I got a phone call from Casey. He says, Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and yeah, no. So he proceeded to tell me that he was in Cincinnati and the newly painted uh, first responders engine would be leading it southbound. And is there any chance I could think of a place we could maybe get a, a shot, maybe with some emergency equipment? And he would uh, let me know, and he would arrange taking care of stopping the train. Uh, I came up with a couple of places. I called uh, Chad Harpole, and uh, Chad lived in uh, Georgetown at that time and knew everybody there, told him what we wanted to do. And uh, while Chad made some phone calls to try to make, to, or, while Chad made some phone calls to arrange to get uh, some police cars and fire trucks lined up, and then we called Casey and told him where to stop the train at, and then I had to get dressed and pack my camera bag a lot earlier and drive to Georgetown, which was an hour and a half in the wrong direction. <laughs> and we stayed there with the main line tied up for eh, 45 minutes to an hour. Everybody got some really good shots. Sorry. But uh, any, anyway, we got done doing the night shots there. And uh, uh, about the time we got done, I had looked at the radar, and it was storming from, like, New Orleans to Knoxville. So we spent the rest of the night driving through the mountains on no sleep in some of the most awful rain and thunder and lightning I've ever been in. It's a Larkspur local T-19 with uh, an unusual pair of engines uh, with one car going to the corning plant in Harrodsburg, coming through Salvisa. Two trains meeting at... Uh, West End of Wadi, or actually, I, uh, it's a westbound train at a place called Hooper, Hooper Hill, which is just west of Wadi, going down towards Shelbyville. I always like that old house in the background. 
And back to one of my favorite places on the Ceno TP, which is Gratison. Uh, we always called it the roller coaster. And a nice uh, one of those former BN Triclops uh, uh, EMDs. A little bit of snow at Tampage. Perfect, perfect morning to me. Another shot in the snow at Convoy. West end of Talmadge uh, in same snowstorm. This was 2014, I believe. Uh, southbound, southbound sitting at uh, by the yard office and depot in Danville. And another one framed up by the columns there. Northbound sitting in the east yard at uh, Danville in the 2 or 3 a.m. snow squall. This was a 29N. Uh, this is in the middle of the Toyota yard at Delta Plain up in Georgetown, middle of the night again. Snow coming down so fast you covered your footprints. Uncle Pete at Nemo southbound. This is a 23G, which is a stack train that originates in Louisville and runs to the east coast in Norfolk. And this is at Marlowe, Tennessee on the K&A. Southbound coal train coming through the Green River dip. If you look just past the signals, down there, you see those uh, two white vertical posts. Uh, that marks the little concrete bridge over where the Green River actually starts. Another one of those few places where you can get the entire train in the shot. I didn't realize I had this much Kings Mountain in there. I didn't think I'd been there that many times. A uh, somewhat rare wide angle shot at the Green River Bridge. Uh, this is west, uh, yeah, westbound, coming into uh, downtown Harrodsburg uh, with the uh, corning plant there in the background. And interesting thing about that plant, uh, about two years before I take, I had taken this. They had laid off most of their employees. They didn't have a lot of business and everything. And as much as I don't like Apple products, I'll say that Apple products brought a lot of good jobs back to Kentucky because that plant exclusively makes what they call Gorilla Glass, which is used on all the iPhone case on uh, the glass and uh, the uh, Apple laptops and other devices. And all the raw material, if you got an iPhone, I guarantee you that's where your glass was made and the raw material was shipped by NS. Central Georgia coming around the curve at uh, Parker's Lake. The old Central Georgia again coming by the old, uh, old general store down in the valley at uh, South Fork, Green River Bridge. Crossing the lake at Burnside. Southbound coming across the Emory River again at Nebo. Another shot of the old Olga co Coal Company. Like I say, that's not, I, I don't know what that building was. It may, may have been a coal, a coal company store at one time. But I just, I just thought it was neat, the, you know, the way they'd restored it. And then this time, the movie had been made for probably 15 or 18 years, but it still looked that pretty good. Probably my least favorite of the heritage units. Coming across the creek at South Isla. Interstate unit with uh, 223 coming up the hill at West Talmadge. Here's a shot that I got mixed reviews on. This was uh, during the NS 30th uh, birthday celebration. 
a few of us joined Casey up there to make our cameras cuss at us for three days. Uh, this was during the uh, one public night shoot we had, and I was pretty much taking all the pictures I wanted to, and I'm just wandering around, and I just happened to notice, notice the new EMD and the old EMD and the uh, loading dock window, and I thought, well, that looks neat. Uh, like I say, I've kind of got mixed reviews on that. You either like it or you don't. Southern GP30 and NNW GP30 East End Shops in Roanoke at, during the 30th uh, anniversary celebration. This was our photo train the last day of that weekend. Uh, freshly painted, good looking SD40, uh, bringing the train out uh, across the Roanoke uh, district. I believe that's near Lithia. Virginia and then going back towards Roanoke uh, what we'd all waited for the southern GP 30 led the train uh, coming by the NNW signals leaving Glasgow Virginia and I believe that is was that solitude? solitude and this is solitude Virginia it was the place O Winston Lake frequently shot at of course at night but it's a beautiful place And that's also at Solitude. Uh, this was going the other direction. They cut the SD40 off just to have the three older engines there to pose for shots. The Southern GP30 ran. The Conrail GP30 has got a blown turbo on it. And the NNW GP30 was running as long as they could keep water in it, which was about 30 minutes at a time. Charlie Poling down at East uh, Tennessee Rail Car since repaired the uh, NW unit there for the group in Roanoke. I hear it's pretty much a new engine nowadays. Now, no offense to those of you that work for Corman. I am. Um, <laughs> I am not the biggest Corman fan because. Because I'm petty. <laughs> because I'm petty and harbor bad feelings. But they still occasionally make a good picture. And here is the uh, sand train coming into Frankfurt out Benson Valley. This was Derby Day 2015. Uh, we'd shot the Derby trains leading Frankfurt. And I believe as soon as they got on HK Tower, the uh, sand train ran and uh, we got two or three shots of it just because the sun was just so absolutely perfect. And this is just on the Louisville side or Shelbyville side of Frankfurt down in the valley. Corman uh, Derby train at Duckers, just uh, uh, almost into Frankfurt starting down Jet Hill. Uh, this is the uh, former Southern SW1, number 1007. Uh, G&O actually owns it. Uh, we had it on the uh, Lexington, Ohio for years. Uh, poor old thing was ragged out. I think they just gave it to us because they didn't feel like scrapping it. And uh, our mechanics in Knoxville, after working on it for a couple of years, actually made a pretty decent engine out of it. Uh, we didn't use it a lot because she wasn't very strong, and we had some pretty good grades and usually had a lot of, a lot of tonnage we pulled, but uh, when one of the other engines are down, our, our mechanic wanted to work on an engine. We bring a train into uh, Versailles or wherever with the road power and uh, climb on 107 and doing our switching. And uh, all these whippersnappers we had working for us, I was still, I think Gordon and me were the only two people that would run that engine because it did not have a 26 brake on it. Nobody know, knew how to use the old brake schedule that was on it. Oh, it's coming up. It's coming up. I got to tell a story about that one, too. Uh, one of the below seven, uh, we were switching uh, Osram out there coming out of the gas track. And I'm standing on top of the old uh, gas track unloader there. Like I say, that plant, everything you see there except uh, for the new warehouses that's out of you off to the left is gone. Yeah. 
me in my natural setting, bib overalls, dip in my mouth, scowl on my face, running. No, about 15. Uh, running one of uh, my favorite GNO engines, uh, 2391, which was X uh, L and N. Uh, she had her, she was old and she had her problems, but by God, that roots blown engine sounded good. I used to ride around when it was 10 degrees outside of the back door open just to listen to it. Uh, this is a uh, 7738, which was also an LXO engine. It actually belongs to BGRM now, restored to its original paint by Mr. Nugent and a couple others. Uh, this was an its occasion of its first visit to BGRM property. I don't remember the year, but uh, uh, we, I can't remember if we, I, I, we had a mechanical problem with the, with the one of the, with the Alco, so I didn't have a choice. We went and we had to go get an engine from work, switch out 30 cars to get down there just to bring a train back up. That's where Cannon hit me over the head. Yeah, well, you deserved it. What well, if it slow down? <laughs> See, I, when I've trained engineers, I don't hit them over the head. I just stand there with a flag stick and, stick, and when they make a mistake, you just whack the side of the control stand. That's usually good enough. And this is uh, looking out the engineer's window, 7738, coming up the hill in the middle on BGRM property. And sitting at the uh, Beasley Road, which is where uh, the uh, LX-08 started. You can see our derail there on the left side. Osram Savania plant to the right. I did that. Actually, a broken rail did it, but I took the blame. For, well, I didn't take the blame for it. I was proud of it. That was the first time I ever turned over cars. I had plenty of derailments before, but that's the first time I ever turned any over. So this is down in Knoxville on the KXHR. It's an X Mill Rocky Road SW1 off to the left. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to it. I haven't seen it down there the last time or two I was down there, but uh, the. Uh, Three Rivers Rambler coming by at, uh, at uh, the old Knox Shell Brickworks. This is the empty, empty block of our 1007 uh, when they uh, rebuilt the uh, block to get to stop leaking water and oil and oil in the water. Uh, they put uh, 645 packs in it, uh, chrome. Uh, everything and after that that engine was like a new one a couple of uh, guys from uh, our Knoxville locomotive works lifting uh, new power packs and getting ready to put them in the block all right now here goes another little story sorry Casey they'll appreciate this at the time that RJ Corbin took over the election in Ohio we were storing the 1007, the SW1, uh, 1002, the SW1 had spent all of its years in Lawrenceburg because NS was trying to persuade BGRM at that time to take possession of Young's High Bridge at Tyrone. Thankfully, they did not. And uh, they used, tried to use this engine to sweeten the deal, but it just wasn't worth it. And... Uh, it was it was still operable, a good engine. The batteries run down on it, but we had emergency motive power uh, problems a couple of times, and we had to go jump it off and actually use it to switch with. So we did use it a time or two. Uh, after Corbin took over the line, uh, about a month or two later, that engine disappeared from Brussels. I got a phone call from a. Uh, associate of mine that worked down in Atlanta in NS uh, that I, he knew I maybe had track of that engine and I told him I said the last time I seen it it was sitting in storage uh, track at Quibicore World in Versailles and he said well we sent somebody and looked the Cormorans line over and we can't find it and I said well I don't know I said maybe the Corman dug it out and took it to the Lexington for safekeeping I don't know 
So they went to Lexington without asking Corbin and poked around, couldn't find it. So I put out an all points bulletin to all the local rail fans, have you seen? And about two weeks later, a buddy of mine, Greg, who worked over in Berea, calls me and he said, are you still looking for that little switcher? I said, yeah. And he said, well, what's the number? Art? 1007. He said, wasn't it an NS? And I said, yeah, it, was, it still had NS markings on it. Well, he said, there's a there's a red and silver Corman engine sitting over here at the uh, aluminum plant in Berea that they're switching cars with, but it's in Corman paint, but it's 1007. <laughs> really? So the next day I called up my contact at NS and I said, you don't know where you got this information from. And I said, I don't know how accurate it is. And I told him what I had been told. So it's about two or three weeks later, I get a phone call from him. I just had got home from work and I get a phone call from him. And he said, uh, there's a special power move on the way down to see no TP. He said, going to be in Danville about an hour. He said, if you're not busy, you're probably going to want to go to Danville and watch it. I said, okay. I heard of oh ninety something coming coming south and by George, look what they found. <laughs> Corman didn't own it. Corman didn't buy it. They didn't even ask to use it. They just took it, painted it, and made it their own. <laughs> but luckily now she is in the very uh, capable and safe hands of the folks down in Knoxville with the GNO. She's back in her proper uh, tuxedo with the uh, Chattanooga Traction Company uh, paint on it and uh, she's in a good home and sees you all the time on the Three Rivers Ramper. Now here's a few rare shots. Uh, who in here has heard of the Moorhead and Morgan Fork or the Moorhead and North Fork? It's another one of those classic Kentucky short lines that operated uh, from Moorhead, Kentucky at one time, uh, uh, almost 20 miles up to a place called Wrigley, uh, they hauled coal and uh, slate and whatnot. And in its later days, the coal mine closed and they ran up to a place called Clack Mountain and they hauled raw slate down. And there was a, uh, a mill there in Clearfield, which is right outside of Moorhead, that uh, took that slate and made uh, slate ceiling tile out of it. And... Uh, you know the uh, little 060 Southern switcher that the Age of Steam Brown House has? Uh, that's where that engine come from. It was in the uh, engine house. Uh, and the uh, three Baldwin RS-12s that they had, uh, or RS-1s, that they had bought from the uh, Durham and Southern back in the 70s, all three of those were still on the property, although the 1200 was the only one that was still operable. And here's just some kind of rare shots of a 1200 out in the daylight being used. Uh, we were pulling one of the other hulks out of the engine house to get some parts off of it. We had some open houses there and they, they were plans to start a tourist railroad there. But unfortunately the elderly gentleman that owned, actually owned the land passed away and when he did uh, those plans went away too because all his uh, son seen was dollar signs from, from scrapping torches. And the only thing that got saved was the uh, little switch, uh, little steam engine, thankfully. Twelve hundred was ex Durham and Southern, and uh, good little engine. She had her problems. A few electrical gremlins like to spit a little oil down and in, but it was a fun engine to run. It's an Alco MRS one twenty forty three belonging to BGRM. Coming up to the 5.5 trestle, not too long after we started running on the uh, five miles of the branch that they own. I did that. And that's when we learned that uh, six axles and that switch don't like each other. And I hate to admit it, but we, we got defeated. We tried for two days to get it up and finally had to call Corman. A slightly blue tint uh, from the old uh, TTI, Trans Kentucky Transportation. Now these are some older TTI shots from back in the 90s. 
So you kind of see a dog's breath, of, a dog's uh, breakfast of power and paint schemes. But this was back when TTI, TTI was really busy. They were running a train in a day and a train in a night, pretty much seven days a week. Passing the depot at Flemingsburg Junction. And downtown Maysville on the CNO headed out to the barge transloader. Big Catholic church in the background. Uh, that's somewhere around Ewing, Kentucky. And this is at uh, Lewis, Lewistown, I believe, right outside of Lewistown, Kentucky. And you can see what I mean by uh, dog's breakfast of engines and different paint schemes. I don't think any one engine were painted the same back then. Uh, usually 25 with loads, 30 empties. Now there's a rare bird. It is an XCB and Q. Uh, what's the model, Mark? U28. U28. Uh, that unit was pretty rare, and not a lot of those left. And that was the XCB and Q. Uh, it was bought by the uh, Illinois Transportation Museum up in Union, Illinois, where it's in safe hands and still wearing TTI paint for now. And running. They, that engine has been its last several years as the uh, Maysville switcher. This is a place called Jacktown, Kentucky, uh, not too far out of Paris. Uh, early on in the morning, the sun just had come up, coming around the S-curves there. This is modern. This would have been 2014 and 15. That's an old tobacco barn there. This is a place called Clark, Kentucky. Uh, they run right through the middle of this guy's huge uh, horse farm. He was always nice to us. But another place where we took the time to stop for a minute and ask if we could go on this property and, you know, shut the gates behind you and do what you want. Crossing the 22-mile-an-hour bridge at uh, Millersburg, Kentucky. Departing, uh, departing uh, Paris just uh, start at the start of the branch early one morning. This is an empty train headed back towards Paris. Uh, this is just at the very top of the hill at Clark, uh, just outside of Maysville. Uh, I don't know if y'all ever been to Maysville and noticed uh, to the east of Maysville, there's a big power plant up there. You see that column of, uh, looks like smoke coming vertically up on the right side there, the right side of the train. Uh, that is the uh, uh, stack vapor out of that plant that's probably 30, 35 miles away. And I'm all the time taking people pictures. And uh, this is one that really caught my eye. Uh, it didn't at first, so I seen it. And of course, Larry, this is Larry Schmock and Alex uh, uh, Moss. Neither one of them usually mind having their picture taken. So that's one engine, reflection of one engine in the window in the side of them taking a picture of it. An older TTI paint scheme. Mr. Nugent was standing beside of me, I believe, when I took that one. We hung out in the guy's tobacco barn. Uh, probably one of my more favorite TTI shots. The horses were so used to the train that they didn't spook, and I knew the train was coming, and I'd walked up there, it was petting on the horse, so I heard the train getting close, and backed off to get the shot, and he paid more attention to me and made a nice prop. Uh, coming across a creek, coming down toward the hill towards Maysville. Uh, this was back in the 90s uh, when the Kentucky Central Chapter NRHS had their little uh, reader number 11 steam locomotive and they ran some limited excursions on TTI. This is one of those, uh, I'm not sure on the line where that's at, maybe towards Millersburg. XICGSD 40-2. Uh, 
It's a uh, Mopac SD40-2. I'm a Baduka in Louisville down at uh, Oak Street Yard in Louisville. If you notice, it actually said VMV on it, on the side of the cab, which was the rebuilding company. Nice set of uh, slug uh, and calf set there on a LG and E empty coal train one morning coming into uh, uh, I went blank. Where? No, it's it's uh no, this is the other side of Princeton. Yeah. But, but, and same train uh, coming into the Armstrong mine down in Armstrong, Kentucky, just past Beaver Dam, getting ready to load and go back to the LG and LG and E plant. Uh, one of the uh, new at that time uh, 70 Max that uh, P and L had acquired from the uh, CSX with the coal train. That's at Black Log, Kentucky, and once again at Armstrong. Uh, they had so much trouble on those SD-70 backs with the uh, toilets backing up and stinking that they just put a porta potty on the rear of the train and, <laughs> you know, long walk, but it was better than having to smell it for 12 hours. So. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the secret city, uh, Alco C-420 toting radioactive material across a bridge. I mean, I can't remember the bridge. This is down where Charlie Pol Charlie Pol and our buddy down there uh, owned and runs. Wade White and all that bunch. And this is kind of a neat shot. That building in the background is part of the K-25 complex. And you all know what the secret city was and the Manhattan Project and how they enriched uranium and that kind of stuff down there. Every, all, all the old buildings down there, except for that one, that's the K-25 building, uh, had been destroyed years ago. And uh, we were down there shooting, and Charlie told me, he said, you might want to try to get a shot of the train with that building because they're going to tear it down. And I, once again, I was back down there a couple months later, and it was gone. And that's a real piece of history right there if, you, if you're into that kind of stuff. That, the picture doesn't do the building justice how big it is. Nice Alco C420 and GP30 combo. No, that's up the hill some. That was on around the bluffs. Louisville and Indiana. Uh, Alex Moss, a friend of mine, and y'all, bunch of y'all probably know Alex. Uh, God help him, he's working for the NS now, but uh, he worked for the LNI for a lot of years. He was a dispatcher and engineer and train master and uh, we went up there with him several times on the weekends uh, when we knew they were running trains to shoot up there because he could get us anywhere on the property he wanted to go this is in louisville coming into the p and l yard passing the cement plant at speed indiana and the green and white is their original paint scheme uh, of course they've been repainting engines into the Penzi inspired brown and gold, which looks a lot better in my opinion. Crossing the uh, B&O at uh, Seymour, Indiana. Another train at Seymour, Indiana with one of the better looking units leading. And at speed again. And this was a set of power that was fixing to pull a unit grain train uh, out of uh, Kokomo Grain in Edinburgh, uh, Indiana, which is not too far out of Indianapolis. And crossing the White, that's a CJ turn headed towards Jeffersonville, crossing the White River. Now here's something up in Cincinnati. It didn't last too long. Uh, the, uh, this is back when the uh, CCT, the Cincinnati East Terminal, took over part of the old NWP line out of Cincinnati. 
Uh, my buddy uh, Chris Edwards was the general manager up there at that time, and uh, he invited uh, Chris Stearns and myself up while we were at Summerville one year. Uh, he said, if y'all want to run over the yard, he said, we'll fire some engines up and do some night shots. So that's what we did. And I, uh, only Alaska units I've ever shot. And I don't know if those things had like twice the bat number of batteries on them or what, but I tell you what, I've never seen that, m that many lights on the engine in my life. And back to CSX for a minute, old Delaware and Hudson unit working as the Lexington switcher, old l and coal and tire in the background, and to kind of orient you if you know where Rupp Arena is on Lexington, uh, if that engine wasn't sitting there, you'd be looking right at the backside of Rupp Arena. So Delaware and Hudson could boost up on the uh, Redding Moo Mountain and uh, Northern. Just kind of a random shot I kind of liked. This is up on the old DT and I, which was, of course, but now the Grand Trunk Western. Uh, but everything was still marked DT and I. Still had DT and I marked switch locks. That's at Hamler, Ohio. Same location. Uh, one of the first I and O trains that they ran over that line once the Grand Trunk uh, sold it to them. We all kind of had hopes that the I and O was going to adopt that paint scheme on the lead one because it's pretty sharp looking. But that was the only one I remember seeing painted like that. That's at Ravenswood, Ohio, just outside of Lima. A uh, couple of Wisconsin Central SD 45 leading a CSX southbound on the uh, Monon at Dean Lake, Indiana. Same train, a little farther down the line. Alco C420 belonging to the Indiana High Rail up at uh, up at uh, Evansville, Indiana. Uh, nice GP30M Santa Fe yellow bonnet at Streeter, Illinois, 1990. Uh, one of the uh, Amtrak services coming down to BN racetrack into Chicago. That's at Downer to Grove, Illinois. One of the Metro Dinkies or commuter trains. Uh, I think that's at the Grange Station, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Brian Sellers uh, just has a heart attack every time I show this picture. He's a big, big Santa Fe fan, but nice met set of Santa Fe uh, units bringing intermodal across the uh, river at Fort, into Fort Madison, Iowa. That was 1991. Uh, Union Pacific E units with a excursion train at Chester, Missouri. Hey, it's a pooch. It's an old Amtrak GE with a P30 CHs or whatever they were. They weren't exactly the uh, best engines and didn't last very long, but uh, they were unique looking anyway. This is up at uh, Beach Grove, Indiana, uh, in the uh, middle 90s. Still an Amtrak uh, E unit languishing up there. I zoomed in when I was working on that shot. That apparently, that was the last use of a fuel tender. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alco RS1, uh, a sharp paint scheme. It's the Texas State Railroad at Rust, Texas. Mark commuter train at, uh, I believe it's Brunswick. Is it Brunswick? Yeah. Brunswick, Maryland. B&O Museum up in Baltimore, mid-90s.
Western Maryland F unit. The uh, original Conrail OCS units for their two E units. Uh, sharp looking train in the daylight. Wasn't much to look at in, when it was cloudy, but uh, I won't give Landrum too much grief for dragging me all over three states chasing that thing because, of course, with the merger, it didn't last much longer. This is the old area Lackawanna Jeep 9 sitting up in storage at Buckeye Yard in Columbus, Ohio in the late 80s. Well, North Carolina service trains at uh, Salisbury, North Carolina, uh, mid-90s. One of the country's newest steam locomotives of the Leviathan over on the BGRM main line coming up the hill into Milner, doing all she could do with two cars. Here's kind of a rare bird, some kind of a maintenance away car from the Clinchville. That was at Kingsport, Tennessee. That thing sits at Don Park. Right now. At where? Don Park. Um, the old newspaper Yeah. <laughs> Illinois Central Death Star on their Santa train in 2010. The big city of Melvin, Illinois. It's the uh, Keokuk Junction KJ uh, Santa train in 19, excuse me, 2010. Uh, just at dusk, and that's an Amish family that stopped to watch the train go by there. And that's also the KJ uh, Santa train after they were done for the night. Uh, Mr. Smedley, who I was hoping would be here today, uh, I spent three days up there in Illinois with him shooting all the local Santa trains, and uh, he knew the crew at the KJ right well. And I wound this was probably, this is Smithfield, Illinois here, and I wound up uh, riding a cab back with uh, one of their engineers all the way 25, 30 miles in the middle of the night on a XVIA FP7. That was kind of neat. Doug Henry. Doug Henry, that's right. Wabash uh, FP7 and Alco FA. Uh, this was actually the NS uh, Santa train on, on the Decatur district. They borrowed uh, equipment from the Illinois Museum up there out of Monticello. It was early that morning before the forced trips ran. That's sitting at the uh, Decatur shop in the rain. And back northeast we go. Coming across the world famous Rockville Bridge at Marysville, Pennsylvania. It's where these next three or four are. We stayed at the bridge view there that night and just sat down there by the river to lawn chairs at sunset and just shot train after train as the light got better. Horseshoe curve sometime in the early 1990s, a couple of SD40 pushers. Eerie, eerie Heritage Unit at Galitzin, Pennsylvania, 2011. No Conrail D8 coming up the uh, west slope of the mountain there on the Pittsburgh line at Lilly, Pennsylvania, coming underneath that massive four-track uh, Penzi signal bridge. Amtrak right on his heels on the center track with a Pepsi can leading, kind of rare. pair of SD-80 Max that are coming off the uh, one of the branch lines up there around South Fork out of the main line. <laughs> National Rifle Association uh, propaganda car. <laughs> <laughs> a 
This is the Reading Historical and Technical Society up in Pennsylvania. At the time we were up there, this was in the early 90s. You had an Alco C, I believe 630, 636 on the right, a Reading original GP30, and both those units were operable. And at that time, the uh, Reading, Blue Mountain, and Northern were actually using those pretty much daily in their little pasture trips they did when they weren't running steam. And I never was much into electric, uh, electric stuff, but we made it a point to uh, shoot some AEM-7 the last time I was up in Pennsylvania because we knew they were going away. They were ugly, not very exciting, but they went fast. Another Pepsi can leading the uh, Pennsylvanian. That's at Gap, Pennsylvania. And that's at Lehman Place. One of the old Metro line or uh, cab cars leading. Another AM7 at Gap. And that's a Strasburg, of course. Great Western 90 is sitting by J Tower. Coming into Cherry Grove. This is a shot I posted on Facebook a couple of years ago, and Facebook removed it because it had tobacco in it. Top of the ridge of Cherry Grove. Now this is a slide my dad took. Uh, it's American Freedom Train number one uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm not exactly sure of the date. Uh, my dad did take a few pictures, and this is one of the better ones he did, so I included it. I, I don't. I was alive, and I'm sure I was there, but I don't remember it. That's uh, reader number eleven over in Paris on the TT and I. That's the one that's on Everett now, right? Huh? That's the one that's on Everett Railroad now. It's in Park and Nicholson. Oh, it is okay. It's stuffed and mounted. <laughs> Frisco fifteen twenty two on an next excursion in Albers, Illinois. Coming into, uh, I believe, Mount Vernon, Illinois, there. Uh, old Buffalo Creek and Golly, they called her Old Slobber Face. This is up at Spencer in the uh, late 1980s. They dressed her up to look like a southern engine and ran her pretty much every day up there. Anybody's been up there for the Heritage event or the Streamliner event, look at that picture and how the roundhouse looks in the background and imagine how it is today and how much work they've done to improve that property. Nickel Plate 587, uh, 611 and 1218 on a triple head uh, deadhead out of Roanoke. I believe that was 89 or 90. 587 again up on the uh, Indiana Fair Train in Noblesville, Indiana. That, that one's here now, right? <laughs> CNO 2765, which is, of course, everybody knows was nickel plate 765 dressed up to suit CSX when they were running some excursions. This is on the CNO main line between Russell and Cincinnati coming through Vanceburg, Kentucky one morning. 
not the most technical of shots. I was trying to get a silhouette there. It didn't come out exactly like I wanted it, but the old B&O across there between Cincinnati and uh, Indianapolis at that time was almost exclusively semaphores. One of my most favorite engines I've run, for a steam engine as far as I've run, is the LNN 52, which also happens to be in Ravenna right now. Back before the shutdown EB&T. Only made one trip up there and I always wanted to get back. Union Pacific 3985, a.k.a. the Clinchfield Challenger. This is coming up the hill into uh, Campbellsville on the LCL, headed towards Huntington for the uh, Santa Train on the Clinchfield. And backtracking a little bit, that's coming, leaving Louisville, coming through uh, Anchorage, Kentucky. Crossing Interstate, uh, crossing Interstate 75 at Walton. And this is on the Clinchfield, I believe that's near Trammell. Okay. Dante. Dante. And once again on uh, <laughs> once again on uh, the bridge at Spears Ferry, uh, Steve Lee, who is a big jokester, big jokester. I've been lucky enough to meet Steve a couple of times, and I'm actually uh, good friends with Steve's brother Gary, who worked on the P and L for years. Uh, Remember on the radio, they blew they blew the uh, boulder down there, and Steve Lee got on the radio afterward, and he said, "Well, that's one of my goals in life. I always wanted to take a leak on the NS." <laughs> y'all thought uh, y'all thought the uh, Clinchfield 800 had a lot of people. NW 1218 making a rare, rare appearance on the Louisville District coming through Harrodsburg. Uh, this would be 1990. Uh, this is coming by the depot at Lawrenceburg. Westbound. That was the last steam movement on the uh, Louisville District. Topping over Wadi Hill. Southern 4501 departing the food terminal. This would have been 92 or 93 coming across uh, the Spears Ferry Bridge again. This is the side of the bridge. This was a morning trip across to Clinchfield, and this is the side of the bridge you never see anybody shoot. Of course, it was been uh, shooting it from the usual spot would have been uh, backlit, and I got to looking around for the train got there, and I found that spot, and I actually liked it better. And the sun was perfect, and we were the only ones back there. That's uh, 4501 at Bowen, southbound on the CNOTP. And at Natural Tunnel, Virginia, I believe they call that Little Tunnel. Natural Tunnel is just ahead. And uh, one of the TBRM fall foliage trips northbound coming across the Emory River at Nemo. Yeah. 
southbound crossing the river at Nemo. This is at St. Paul, Virginia, I believe turning on the Y there between the Clinchfield and the uh, N and W. This is a Sunbright, Virginia on the uh, Southern Railway line on the Appalachia District. Uh, 611 bustling up the river there uh, somewhere in the Narrows. Parisburg. Parisburg. Passing the uh, that famous uh, power plant there at Glen Lynn coming down the mountain. Coming into Bluefield Yard coming up the mountain. We needed to save time. We could have skipped this part. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, phone, and this is it. Uh, that last shot there was at North Fork, uh, Virginia, uh, slipping on the curves there on the grade up into uh, Elkhorn Tunnel. I think that's Farm, Farm, West Virginia, on the Pokey. It's on the uh, Dry Fork branch coming into Yeager, uh, West Virginia. They made a circle trip out of Roanoke uh, up the uh, valley and come across the Dry Fork branch over to the Pokey and back into Roanoke. A nice long circle day trip. A photo run by Georgetown in 1990. And that's at uh, the old Culling Tire at Jaeger. Uh, my best effort at uh, reproducing a old Winston Lake shot, except in the daylight, that is downtown North Fork, Virginia. And if you ever seen any of his books or photographs, he has a one of his stunning night shots taken right there with those exact same buildings in it back in the 50s. Photo run by Pritchard, West Virginia, just outside of Canova, coming under the uh, big mainline calling tower there. So we're on a clinch valley. I'm not really sure where that's at. Western Maryland Scenic 734 Cumberland crossing the uh, Cumberland Maryland crossing the Potomac River. And Helmsteader's Curve. This was probably 2001, 2002, somewhere in there. Now here's a few images from what has to be, in my opinion, and a few other people, the single best steam trip NS has ever operated, period, on the uh, NNW's Buchanan branch between uh, Alt-1 and uh, Grundy, Virginia. Slow railroad, lots of grades. Uh, they just worked the crap out of that engine. I mean, you can see what the grade is there. Uh, I worked. I didn't shoot video, but I wish I had because the sound was incredible. That's at Hurley, West Virginia, coming by one of the coal plants there. It was over one percent. I got a track chart somewhere. Uh, leaving Willer Yard, uh, coming up into. Uh, Glen Camp, uh, Virginia, or West Virginia. That's uh, no, that's not Alt One. What's the other tunnel top of the mountain? The other side of that tunnel is where I thought you were going to slide down that mountain that day. Rate, rate tunnel. 
was leaving Weller Yard, uh, Virginia, coming across the Tug Fork. And I like my telly shots, but sometimes you've got to do something like this because nature has a way of just making the biggest things like a train look small in comparison. And that is crossing the Kentucky, uh, West Virginia state line, which is in the middle of that creek. The road is actually on the Kentucky side, and the engine is just about ready to cross over into West Virginia after they turned on the Y over to Pokey. That's pretty near the same spot. I don't remember the name of that creek. And some of the trips on the CNOTP is the first shot I had uh, gotten of a steam locomotive leading anything in 21 years on the CNOTP. Uh, and back in 2014, this is at Rice, just outside of Cincinnati. And that's uh, going north uh, down Erlanger Hill, part of Erlanger there in the, in the foreground, and coming across one of the big bridges there. One of the probably the top five of my favorite shots I've taken in 20 years. That's uh, crossing the uh, Ohio River, leaving Cincinnati, 2014. Northbound coming across the Eagle Creek Bridge uh, at Sadieville, Kentucky. Uh, coming underneath the uh, signals at Delaplane, Kentucky. The uh, Toyota yard is right there to my right. We were actually leaned up against the fence there uh, to shoot that. My favorite picture of this is that a Kenova? What's that? Is that a Cincinnati. It's down uh, CP Fayette, just on the north side of Lexington. Uh, they were uh, bringing the train over to the NS yard after it uh, spent a week over in the Corman yard, safely tucked away. And this was a Friday before the Lexington trips. So they were bringing it over to the NS yard. Northbound coming off the uh, Cumberland River Bridge at Burnside through the uh, slide fence. Southbound at Kings Mountain. Evan, is this the picture you were wanting? Yes. All right. Remind me next week and I'll get you a copy. Okay. They turned the end, uh, the engine on the uh, little wide down there in the Corbin yard instead of tying up the belt line and everything. And uh, we were, I think me and TJ were the only ones there that I remember. But it kind of made a neat backdrop with the SD 45s up on the hill. Obviously, had a different manager on the property that day. <laughs> North. <laughs> you had to be there. We didn't want to be there. Northbound coming underneath the, uh, coming off. Uh, Kings Mountain and coming underneath the signals of South Fork. And got northbound at Sellersville, Tennessee. That's Kentucky Tennessee State Line. On one of the Lexington and Oneida trips, 2014. Uh, smoky arrival into the storage track and go around the wide Oneida. Departing or coming out of the tunnel at uh, TVRM one morning. I think that was a Somerville trip we chased. It's coming up, coming uphill into Rock Spring, Georgia. Everybody else was. If you ever been to Rock Spring or, or you've seen pictures there, it's the place out on the CC short line. It's always got a steam engine going by this decrepit old building, and it's usually got an old black car sitting in front of it. <laughs> the 50 people that were there were getting that shot. I had that shot, so I said, hey, let's go vertical. And Crossing the Chattanooga, not Chattanooga, but the Chattooga River in Tryon, nor uh, Georgia. 
coming through the uh, Chickamauga battlefield. Rock Spring once again. Double header coming out of Rossville, Georgia, coming up the big hill there. Another one of those AF shots at 6.30 leaving uh, uh, Tryon. Uh, this was 45.01 on her uh, first tiptoe onto the main line after restoration. This was at Utawa, Tennessee. On the NS uh, main line, they stopped to inspect something and took off like the devil was chasing them. This is on the uh, N and W at uh, Withville? Withville. Withville, yeah. Uh, once again on the uh, N and W, in sort of the same position. I think they call that CP White, CP White, or something like that. Now they changed the name of it. Washington. Thank you. Still plenty of NWCPLs out there to enjoy. Yay, <laughs> Coming by the brickyard uh, at Webster, Virginia. Same place. And that's coming up, uh, I, believe, I believe it's Elliston, if I remember right. Coming up the steep part of the grade. Downtown Roanoke with the old NW office building in the background. Forest, Virginia, leaving Lynchburg. A little bit of 765. This is at West Peru, Indiana. Coming through Roanoke, Indiana, just after they left Fort Wayne, uh, headed towards uh, Lafayette. One beautiful Sunday morning. Y'all want to see people pictures? Sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll zip through them. Casey's giving me the EY. <laughs> That's, I was in. I was in my mid twenties there. It's my mom off to the left at a KRM members uh, appreciation dinner on the diner. And what I usually looked like at KRM, at least on the days we ran steam. I was probably in my teens there at forty five oh one under the shed at Chattanooga. As, uh, that's me, I don't know, I had all these pictures of me in there. Uh, but anyway, that was the first revenue trip of the Knoxville and Holston River Railroad in uh, in uh, Knoxville. Chris Starn shot that shot. That's in the cab of the uh, 1200 up in Moorhead. Some of the... Uh, a crude KRM crew and our trusty photographer off to the right. And I could not end this show without uh, saying a few words about a few very good people we lost this year. And Jim Wren was one of them. Uh, Jim was one of those people you liked him and you agreed with him or you didn't. I got along with him real well, and if it hadn't been for him, I, I, him pushing me, I would have never got out of my comfort zone about uh, doing some writing for Trains Magazine and and uh, submitting photographs. Thanks to him, I had uh, cover shots and uh, just all around good guy. I miss him. That's the Jim and uh, Steve Forster on the right shooting out on the scene of T at Parker's Lake. 
Jim and Steve and Tunnel Man Butch Atkins on the right taking my picture. Cutting down Tish's wildflowers. And that's uh, Captain Atkins there, Butch Atkins. A lot of y'all know Butch. He's a works over at the University of Kentucky, but uh, his thing in life is railroad tunnels, whether they're still being used or abandoned. And every once in a while, I got him out of his comfort zone, like renting a, a pontoon boat on a 13-degree morning in March to go shoot the other side of the Burnside Bridge because the sun was good. My buddy uh, Junior Russell, he's the engineer at Lowell for NS. There used to be this gnarly old tree we called, called the turtle tree at Wadi because it kind of looked like a, a mean old turtle. And for somehow it came to addition, everybody had to stick their arm in a turtle's mouth. There's Casey and Steve Forrest, and in the middle, our friend Chris Williams, who's also no longer with us. Chris was uh, uh, partners with Charlie Poland down in uh, Oak Ridge. Another person we lost way, way too soon. Chris was an outstanding guy. I don't think he had an enemy in the world He'd do anything for you. Chris and Mr. Straight Bill O'Dell there. I wish Chad was here to see this. I was really hoping Chad was going to be here to see this. There's the, there's an inside joke here, and I'm not going to go into it. But uh, you think about Family Guy for a minute, and you, you figure it out. <laughs> Mr. Starn and his mighty drone. Downtown Lagrange, Mr. Starns and. Running the train. Ah, yes, Eric Landrum, our friend from uh, uh, Cincinnati. This was back in the 90s. And he had the most perfect porn stash anybody had ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Caleb Herndon, myself, Butch, and Adam Wells. South end of Burnside Tunnel number four, standing right at the lake. Uh, back when I could still do silly things like make eight mile hikes because Butch wanted to. Larry Schmock on the left, Chad Harpole sitting, Alex Moss, and uh, Kurt uh, DeWald shooting TT and I at Flingsburg Junction. The Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Another one of our good friends that we don't see much anymore, and I'm not trying to be blasphemous here, but uh, John Owens up there, he had the perfect son of God beard. <laughs> on purpose or not, I don't know. So the morning they, uh, the Sunday morning they ran 6.30 to 09, and we were up on top of King's Mountain waiting, and I had one of those evil ideas, and I said, I said, John, get on that pile of rock and act like you're doing a miracle. Everybody else, bow your head. <laughs> and it, it's, it's easier to get people to do stupid stuff than you might think. <laughs> the Yeti. Steve Smedley with his uh, fresh caught lunch. Randy, make sure you, hey, Randy, make sure Steve knows that was in there. Mr. Duncan enjoying a fine Kentucky L8. This was uh, during the time that we were getting uh, out. I got my $1,500 shot of UP844. That's a story for a different time. That was a bad day. Another one we lost way too soon. Jonathan Guy off to the left. Jonathan was another of those fellows. I don't think he had a lot of enemies. He was a gentle giant, 
and uh, I'm very proud to have known him and been able to hang out with him as much as we did. Of course, he passed away unexpectedly much too young. But he, Thank you. Jonathan again, I don't know. It's somewhere in Tennessee we were shooting the F units. I don't remember where. No, could have been. Now, this is another one of my students. Like I said, it's easy to get people to do things when you tell them to do it. We'd been chasing this train to Tala, Alabama and back. I didn't need no more shots of it. And this is at Wauhatchee, Tennessee, almost back to Chattanooga. So we were standing there, and I said, hey, guys, when the train gets here, turn around and wave at me. That shot came out all right. It's my buddy, Junior Russell, riding the left side of a catfish. Our favorite F unit engineer, Mr. Tony King himself. T.J. Mann, our uh, personal weather person, and uh, Stephen Allen Jones riding one of the first public NS trips out of Chattanooga. Oh, you had uh, that Mark. What's that? I said, really? Thank you all, and uh, Joe recorded everything, and give us a few weeks. We're going to get this up on YouTube at a bit of private URL, so in a couple of three weeks, you can contact me or Joe, and if you want to see it again or whatever, uh, it'll be there to see. Thank you all.